your committee. Turn off all cell phones. Use your cell phones in here. You've already been given a warning. You'll have to watch the rest of the proceedings in the other courtroom. We're on the record in 177-3951, State of Texas versus Timothy Simpkins. Oh. Both sides ready for the jury? Thanks, ready. Thanks, ready. All right, let's bring this. They called Jeremy Walker. Jeremy Walker. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony which you have to give and the cause him on trial? Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. All right. Train down and have a seat. Make sure you listen to the entirety of the questions that are asked. You make sure the attorneys are completely done talking before you begin your answer. That way you don't talk over them and they don't talk over you. And when you answer, talk all the way to the back of the courtroom. We have microphones, but if you talk all the way to the back, you definitely understand what you're saying, okay? All right. Right. Yes, sir. You're waiting. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Will you introduce yourself to the members of the jury, please? Uh, my name is uh, Jeremy Walker. I'm a uh, coach and teacher at Timberview. And you're still employed there, is that correct? Correct. How many years have you taught there at Timberview? Uh, four. This would be my fifth. How many years have you been in teaching? Twenty. In coaching? Twenty. Okay. What do you coach? I currently coach girls basketball. Um, and you're still PT English, right? Correct. Okay. I'm going to take you back to October the 6th, 2021. At that time, was your, was your uh, classroom 
number 2037? Correct. All right. And that's on the second floor at Kimberview, correct? Yes. Okay. And uh, that particular morning, um, did something unusual catch your attention while you were in your classroom? Yes. What was that? Uh, I was calling parents, and uh, I guess it, the bell had just rang for second period. I was actually supposed to be in basketball, but I stayed and I started calling uh, parents, telling about the grades and missing assignments, things like that. And then I uh, heard someone screaming, and it was a female screaming for help. I didn't know who it was at first, so uh, that's you. That's not normal. <laughs> so I uh, I got up and went to my door, got to my door and realized I didn't have my keys, and went back and grabbed my keys from my desk. And then I went out and walked down the hall towards, uh, and it was, when I opened the door, it was Miss Altman in the hallway. She was in the hallway. How far from Miss Altman's classroom is your classroom? Uh, in a matter of feet, I don't. It's, so the length of the hallway, I'm at the beginning by the stairwell. She's about halfway down. So however far it is, the length of the hallway, she's halfway. So I don't know. So when you walked out into the hallway, you already saw her standing in the hallway? Correct. Okay. And did you see uh, any other teachers walking towards her classroom? Yes. Who did you see? Uh, as I'm walking, uh, Mr. Pettit comes out in front of me. And he looks at me and is like, what's going on? I tell him, I don't know. And so he walks in front of me. He's probably five feet in front of me, maybe 10, maybe. Enough for us to have a conversation that quick and not have to raise our voices, so we were pretty close. Did you have to return to your classroom briefly when he was ahead of you to get your keys? No, I, I didn't leave the classroom. I went to my door, and when I got to my door, I was about to leave and realized I didn't have my keys, so I went back to my desk. So I was in my room, and then when I came out and was walking down the hall, by the time I got to him, he was coming out of his classroom. And this issue with the keys is kind of an important deal, is that correct? Yeah. Why is that? Because uh, if I would have had my keys at first, but I would speculation. I don't see how it calls for speculation. Uh, overall, uh, when I went, if I hadn't gone back for my keys, I would have been in front of it, because I would have been out of the room before him. And I would have, been, I would have turned into the classroom first. If you had not had to go back to get your keys out of your doorway, it would have been you who entered the classroom instead of Mr. Pettit? Objection, okay. speculation. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure about speculation, but that's, that's the, we, the way it was going was a leading question, so why don't you try a different one? I was, I'm trying to clarify what you were explaining before about having to go back for your keys. Correct. Explain that a little further. <clears throat> um, so what I'm saying, I, I, so my, my desk to my room door is probably from me to that camera. And so I walked all the way over, realized I didn't have my keys. I started to go out the door, and then I walked back, and then I walked back out the door, to the door. So from going over, back, and over, that time I would have been, I would have got to the classroom before him. And we've had a conversation previously about who would have been first into the classroom, you or Mr. Pettit, is that correct? Correct. And if you had not returned for your keys, perhaps you would have been in the place that Mr. Pettit is in. Objection, speculation, and leading. She's clarifying what the witness said. Um, Speculation is overruled. Leading, yes. All right, sustain. <clears throat> I get it. Do you have an opinion about whether or not you would have entered that classroom first if you had not returned for your keys? I think so. Okay. Like, yeah. So, do you hear gunshots? No. When I when I walk out, so I walk out. And I'm walking down the hallway. And so Pettit's classroom is on my left. Miss Alma's classroom is on my right. 
headed is two doors down from Altman. Towards me, two doors towards me. So I'm walking right before I get to Pettit's room. He comes out and walks in front of me. And then he goes, the door is open like this because the door is open into the hallway. They don't open inside the classroom. So the hallway's on the right. I mean, the door's on the right. And it's open like this. So I can only see the door. I can't see in the room. Pettit disappears behind the door in front of me. What happens next? It's a little girl standing right here, looking into the classroom. And I asked her, I was like, what are y'all doing? Like, what's going on? Because I don't know, I can't see anything. Whatever is happening, Altman is in the hallway, and I can't see in the classroom. I don't see anything in the classroom. All I know is, is chaos in the hallway. And, uh, and so some kids try to come out of uh, Crochet's room. I was like, hey, y'all just go back. It's my business. Let's go back. So I pushed, I told him to go back because her room was right here. And so right before I was about to grab the door handle to pull it, the little girl's face changes. Because at first she was laughing. She was like, ah, you know, laughing. And then her face just completely changed. It just like went blank. And I was like, what? what's going on? And that's when I saw a couple people. I looked around the door and I saw a couple people run out of the classroom. And so and right when I was about to grab it, boom, I took off back to where I came from. So, Have you heard gunshots by the time you start running? The gunshots caused me to run. Okay. Uh, how many gunshots do you think you heard? <laughs> where I'm from, you hear one, that's enough. Okay. So uh, the first one, and I took off. Now, at that point, it's... I go, my mind goes silent, so I'm just running. And uh, Miss uh, Delgado is back down the hall. And she's frozen on the wall, and I'm like, I'm just like running, run, and she don't move. So I run past her. I try to grab her. Sorry, Miss Delgado, I'm moving. So she stayed there, and I ran around the corner, and then I turned left down the ECHS hallway, and I started yelling shelter in place because. You know, it was gunshots. So as I'm running, I get past ECHS to the commons, the top of the commons, and I'm still yelling. And uh, I see uh, Gaither downstairs, Officer Gaither. He's an SRO. Who is the officer? Who is Officer Gaither? He's, our, he's one of our SROs okay. on campus. Okay. And uh, I, yelled, I yelled down to him that, you know, he shooting, him, shots fired. And he just kind of looked at me like, what? I was like, shots, shots fired, somebody shoot. And by that point, LaRue, officer other SRO, <clears throat> popped up behind me. And uh, when he was standing there, he was like, where? And I actually said 21 Hall, <coughs> which is the opposite room, opposite end of the building. But then I pointed and was like, no, English. It's down in English. So uh, he went back down. He actually went back down to ECHS, ECHS hallway. And by that time, I realized it was a, I kind of realized it was, people were shooting, and I was in the middle of the hallway. So I tried to find somewhere to go. Uh, this time, were you down on the first floor? No, I never made it to the first floor. Okay. Did you try and shelter and place yourself? Yeah. What, where did you go? <laughs> what did you do? So I ran, once I realized it was the middle of the hallway, it's not funny, I'm sorry. But as I got to the commons and then LaRue left, I was kind of breathing real hard because I'm old and fat and I ain't ran that hard in a long time. So I realized I was standing in the hallway and I needed to go somewhere. Well, my classroom is back where they were shooting. And I don't have any kids in my room because I was supposed to be in basketball. So I didn't want to go back there. So I ran in the opposite direction and I ended up at the first door I come to is one of the associate principal offices or assistant principal offices. And uh, I got to the door <laughs> and Miss Underwood was standing in the door. Our doors have the little glass windows. And she just, she looked me dead in my face, closed the door, locked it, and said, I'm sorry, and ran. And Did she then, mouth, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry? Yeah, because she, cause she didn't know what was going on. Okay, I'll, so speculation. And there it is. Uh, it's a little.
Next question. Ms. Underwood would not let you into her room? No, she would not. She was, she's the secretary in the office for the principals, and she just closed the door and locked it. And so I was standing there, and then I, it took me a second to realize that I have a master key, so I just opened it behind her and closed the door and locked it, and then we sheltered in place together. So she kind of, I tease her now because she locked me out, but it is what it is. Is that protocol? It is protocol. And that's why I wasn't mad at her. She did what she was supposed to do. She heard, because she has a radio, so she heard everything. And then she got up, and by the time I got to her, she had got up and locked it. And she was in the process of locking her door and turning the lights out, and she left me in the hallway. I tease her now, but it's, she did what she was supposed to do, and I, that's why I wasn't mad at her. While you're in Ms. Underwood's classroom, describe what's going on inside that classroom. What you're doing, what the other students are doing. So, where she is is an office. So it's not any, any students in okay. the office. There are no office aides, it's just her. And the two APs who shared the office, they weren't in there. And so it was just me and her. So once I got in, she was already, she, like I said, she had turned her lights out which is protocol, and she was sitting, like hiding in the corner, and I just went and found her. I literally crawled on the floor, and she was crying, so I heard her. So I just crawled over to her, and we both sat there and held hands, and we really cried together because we didn't know what was going on. And then uh, I realized uh, I was supposed to be in basketball, and I couldn't tell my girls. And so, in the gym, you don't always hear announcements because we're practicing. And then I, well, well all I knew was a school shooting. So, I couldn't tell them. And then, I had left my phone on my desk in my classroom. So, I couldn't call them. So, that, so now I was trying to sit there and Try to figure out how to tell the girls so that I could. So that was, that was a little rough. Because I didn't know what was happening. Were you trying to reach your family? Yeah, but I couldn't because I got my phone. And uh, uh, so it took me a few minutes to calm down. And I realized that I actually knew my wife's phone number. Which is rare. So uh, I crawled over to the desk and pulled the phone under the desk with me, and I uh, called my wife to try to calm down, but apparently she said I was not calm. Uh, and she, uh, I told her that I was okay, and that to, uh, I left her a message because she wouldn't, she didn't answer because she didn't recognize the number. She's a teacher also, and she was at work on the other side of town. Uh, she, she at the time she taught him to ski. So, you have Jackson area. That's the same. Uh, just try to make sure you answer the questions that are asked, and then she'll ask you, ask you the next question and so on. Okay. Gotcha. Great. All right. Your question. Coach, did you finally reach your wife or family? Uh, no, I had to leave a voicemail. Has a witness. Cross examination. Mr. Walker, how long have you worked for Mansfield ISD? Four years, about to be five. Are you all trained about how to handle fights at school? No. So each teacher just has to use their own discretion of how they handle these things? <clears throat> as far as I know. Are the school resource officers in Mansfield allowed to break up fights? I guess. I mean, I've never been a resource officer. Okay. Know. And in regards to in the hallway when you saw kind of getting chaotic, you mentioned on direct that you did see another young girl in the hallway. Mm -hmm. 
Did you know her name? No. Okay, and this is the girl that you said that was living in the classroom? Yes. Okay. Was she filming anything while she was in the hallway? I don't remember her having a phone. Okay. Um, And when you saw Mrs. Altman in the hallway, did she ask you to do anything? No, she was, she was, not me specifically, she was just asking for help. She was screaming, help me, help me. And then she was just upset and she was in the hallway and then she was trying to direct her other students that were in the hallway. And which hallway did you initially say you were in when this happened? <clears throat> The, the English, ooh, sorry. Hey, turn that off. I got you. I'm good. Sorry. Excuse me. Uh, I'm, so I'm on 20, my room is 2037. So if you haven't seen Timberview, it's a hallway like this. It's a long hallway. It has classrooms on both sides. And then there's cross two cross-section hallways that go to the parallel hallway. It's almost like a, like a, like the letter capital H, but it has two cross hallways instead of one. So I'm at the end of the this hallway, and it goes all the way the length of the hallway. So I walk out of my classroom and walk down towards Ms. Altman. So I pass the first cross section, and her hallway is at the second cross section. I mean, her classroom is at the second house, uh, cross section. May I approach the witness, Your Okay, Mr. Walker, I am showing you what has been pre-marked as state's exhibits number one and number two. I'm sorry, did you mark them as defense exhibits? Defense exhibits, sorry. Um, in regards to the first exhibit, can you tell me what that is? It's a map of a school, first school. Okay, and is it an accurate diagram of what Timberview High School looks like? As far as I know, yes. Okay, has it been altered in any way since the incident happened? It's a kind of a silly question, but has the school changed or made any improvement that we can't see on this map? Just a uh, baseline diagram. No. Okay. In regards to defense exhibit number two, what are we looking at here? It is the second floor of the school and a picture of the gym. Okay. And is that the same gym that you all practice in? Yes. And is your classroom indicated on uh, defense exhibit number two? Yes. Defense offers, state's exhibit, defense exhibit number one and two. Consider it the opposing counsel. <coughs> no objection. Defense exhibit one and two are admitted. Okay, so on defense exhibit number two, so can you tell us where is your classroom? 2037, that's right here. Okay, and can you please go ahead Hold and. Slow down just a bit. Thank you. Can you please go ahead and publish to the jury by holding? Oh. It's right here. Okay, and so you're at the end of the hallway. Correct. Where is Ms. Altman's classroom in relation to yours? Right here. Okay, so on the opposite end. It's about, well, it's about halfway. About halfway. Yeah, it's in front of the girls' restroom. And how long would you say, what is the distance between the two of those? That's what I said earlier. I don't know how long it is in feet. I mean, it's, I don't know how long the classroom, I mean, the hallway is. So. And your initial report, do you recall, thank you for that, sir. Do you recall when you first talked to the detectives about this case, where you said it, that you were located? That's it again. When you first talked to the detectives about this case, do you remember where you told them you were when this incident happened? What hallway were you in? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Which hallway were you in? The English hall. Okay, on which end? When it started at the beginning? Yes. In my classroom. Okay, and where... So how were you able to see what was going on in her classroom? 
I just said, I never saw in the classroom. I came out of the door, walked down the hallway, and before I actually looked in the classroom, there was a shot. And so I never, I never actually got in the classroom. In the initial report, when you first talked to the officer, did you state that you were in hallway 21, the 21 wing versus the 22 wing? No. When I said when I was running and Officer uh, LaRue came up, I told him the wrong hallway. I was like, hey, it's 2100. Then I pointed at the English hallway. I said, no, it's an English hallway because 2100 is mad. Oh, talking to Because 2100 is what? Mad. Yeah, just slow down when you're talking. Your, your words start to go so fast. Sorry. That's okay. Ask your next question. Okay, so you told the resource officer to go to the 21 wing, which is the math wing. Originally, yes. Uh, okay, and did you say that just out of panic and fear at that time? I was confused. I just said the wrong number. And then I corrected it and was like, no, English. Okay, um, and just to clarify, you didn't see any commotion actually in this office classroom. You just heard the yelling? Correct. And did you see any students in the hallways recording? Not that I can remember. Like in the hallway? Yes. Like I said, a kid tried to come out, a couple of kids tried to come out of Miss Crochet's room, and one of them, he came out. Of course, they all got their phones in the end, but he didn't make it out of the classroom. I actually told him to go back and close the door. So as far as anyone else, I don't remember anyone else except for that little girl, and I don't remember a phone in her hand. No further questions from the defense. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Okay. Redirect. <coughs> no, Your Honor, nothing further for this witness. All right, may this witness be excused. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. All right. Yes. May be thank you for your testimony. Call your next witness. Still call Jason Fernandez. Jason Fernandez. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in the call town trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you guys? Yes, I do. All right, come on up here and have a seat. Thank you. As you're answering questions, make sure that you answer all the way to the back of the room loudly. You've got all those photos moving down and make sure that we understand. Okay? Yes, sir. All right. State your witness. Yes. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and tell them how you were employed? My name is Jason Fernandez, F-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-S. I work for the City of Arlington Police Department at the Crime Scene of here. All right, hold on. So when you spell and do things like that, you're talking so fast. Talk all the way back, okay? Don't talk into that thing. Sit back and talk to the back of the courtroom. That will slow you down. Go ahead. <clears throat> how long have you been with Arlington? 13 years. How long have you been doing crime scene? Four years. What did you do before you went to crime scene? I worked as a records clerk. You helped do a search in relationship to this case, is that right? Yes. Right. Where did you go? 3030 Claremont Drive, apartment 1109. You said 1109? Yes. For our purposes, you ended up searching. Uh, one of the bedrooms, is that right? 
I collected items from the bedrooms. I did not search them. Okay. And um, my first witness says. Show you what I've marked for identification. I say it's 149, 148, and 150. Tell me if you recognize them. Yes, I do. Now, these are photographs. Yes. And this is uh, photographs of a, a gun that you collected. Is that correct? Yes. So we're going to offer states 148, 149, and 150. master bedroom closet on a shelf? It's up underneath something. Correct. <clears throat> the living estates, 149, you remove or whatever was set on top of it, removed it, so you get a better picture of it. Is that correct? Correct. Is the handgun after it's been removed and rendered safe? Why is there one bullet sitting out? That was the live round that was in the chamber. What kind of gun is it? It's a Glock Model 21, 45 caliber. And you also found another magazine that goes, another Glock magazine, is that correct? Correct. And when I talk about magazine, for those who don't know about guns, this is a magazine? Yes. Where was that other magazine found? In the same bedroom on the dresser. And was it loaded? Yes. Show you what we've marked for identification purposes. Estates 18. Do you recognize this box? Yes. Okay. Just for purpose of record, the firearm is in this box and it's been previously made safe by your bailiff. Okay. All right. So estates 18 is the the box that the gun was put into. Yes. Okay. Estates 18B is the firearm. Correct. And this is the same firearm that we just saw in those photographs and that you recovered from that report compartment. Yes. States 18C is the magazine that we just saw in that photograph. Is that correct? Yes. Eighteen D is a um, eighteen D is exemplars from the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office. Is that correct? Yes. You didn't place those there. Those come from the ballistic. Uh, expert who did some test fire. Correct. Okay. Judge, we are going to offer states 18 for the record only. And we're going to offer states 18B and 18C for all purposes and 18D for the record only. Hold on. You're offering B and C for all purposes and D for the record and A and 18 for the record? Yes, sir. In states 18A is a, another packaging that was inside the box. Or from that for the record only. All right. Any objections to B and C? I guess I have no objection to it. All right. Those be admitted. Just permission to publish by holding? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so this is <coughs> the clock that you were referring to earlier that you found. Yes. And this is the magazine that goes with it. 
Yes. Uh, we have the animal books in another package, is that right? Yes. When we say it's been made safe, there's a zip tie we're going to do it to keep it from being fired or operated. Correct. Okay. And just one second, Judge. No. Do you recognize stage 19? Yes. What is it? It's the eight rounds of ammunition that were removed from the handgun. The one with it, stage 18? Yes. And for purpose of the record, stage 19 is the envelope that you put it into, while stage 19A is the actual ammo. Is that correct? Yes. Judge, we're going to offer stage 19A for all purposes in stage 19. Mission published by Holden. Mm -hmm. And so the jury understands what caliber? 45 caliber. Is that a. Do you know anything about ammo? I do. Okay. And looking at this ammo, what is it about it? It's a hollow point. So what does that mean? It means that it's designed to expand upon impact. And does it have a copper jacket on the outside? Yes. When you say designs expand on impact, what is that? that? If you look closely at the tip, there's small little grooves. So as it impacts something, the, it mushrooms out and expands. So the copper jacket will, will come apart and the lead core will keep going. Correct. And what's the purpose of that? To increase uh, ballistic velocities and uh, impact damage. Makes a bigger hole. Yes. Now we've marked for identification purposes stage 20. Do you recognize this? Yes. What is it? This is the magazine, the Glock 45 magazine that was collected from the dresser. States 20 is the, is the packaging that it was in, and states 20 A <coughs> is the actual magazine itself. Is that correct? Correct. Now, 621, do you recognize this? Yes. 
what is that? That is the ammunition that was removed from this magazine. Stage 21 is the packaging it was in, and states 21A is the actual ammo, is that correct? Correct. Judge, we will offer states 20, for the record on 20A, the magazine, for all purposes. States 21, for the record only. States 21A, for all purposes. Any objections to 20A or 21A? Okay. Twenty A and twenty one A are admitted. Yes, I'm admitting the ones that you offered for the record. Commissioner published by Holden? Looking at the ammo that was found, I'm going to use the term spare magazine. Is that hollow point or what kind of ammo is it? That is considered ball. What's the difference between that and the hollow point? That is a solid core. Don't make a hole, but just want to expand like the hollow point. Correct. How many rounds were in the spare magazine? Nine. How many were in the Got it. Seven in the magazine and one in the chamber. So a total of eight? Correct. A total of 17? Correct. How many will that magazine that was in the handgun, how many will it hold? 13. So you had how many here? Seven plus one. Plus one, so a total of eight and a total of 13. Correct. Spare magazine, how many will it hold? Ten. And how many were you? Nine. I'll pass the witness. Cross examination. Yeah, that's pretty good, Judge. So, um, Officer Commander, you were told by which detective to go to 30-30 uh, Fairmont? My sergeant told me to respond to assist the detectives. And who was that sergeant? Sergeant McGee. So you get a call, are you at the PD or are you somewhere else on another call? At the time that she mm -hmm. told me to go to the apartment, I was at the station. Okay. You're from the station to the apartment. Officers are already there? The officers, detectives, yes. So your job was to go photograph? Photograph. Collect evidence? Collect. You get the gun and the clip on the mic band? Yes. Right. So just from your testimony here, your role, you don't know that, you don't know how many clips were taken to uh, Timothy High School, do you? No. So the one you found in the, in the bedroom could have still, it could have been left at 30, 30 Claremont, correct? Could have. So once your role at collecting the evidence is over, what do you do next? In this particular case, after collection, I bring it back to the station. I did additional documentation, and then the items were uh, turned over to another CSI. Which CSI was um, turned over to? Newquist. Excuse me? Newquist. And so he has a different role than what you play. Uh, you collect it, you turn it over to him, and what's his duties and responsibilities? They or she uh, then package and process. And so once they're packaged and processed, are they taken somewhere or are they kept in Arlington and evidence lockers? They are turned into our property and evidence facility. Any redirects? No, sir. All right. Thank you for your testimony. Maybe he be excused yes. for today. You might need him. Yes, sir. Okay. And then you're excused until you're asked to come back. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Please call your next witness. The state would call Deshaun Tobias. Deshaun Tobias? Yes, sir. All right. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give and the cause now in trial to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes, sir. I'm going to have to see you. I'm going to ask you uh, to do a couple of things. Make sure you, when you answer a question, you answer it out loud and answer all the way to the back of the courtroom. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Please. If you can't hear it when you say it like that. Yes, sir. There you go. And then make sure you listen to the entire question asked of the state so you don't talk over them and they don't talk over you. And same for defense, okay? Yes, yes sir. Okay. State your witness. Can you, for the court reporter's benefit, spell your first and last name? Spell my first and last name? Yes, sir. B-A-I-S-H-A-W-N. Deshaun Tobias. T-O-B-I-A-S. Mr. Tobias, do you know the defendant in this case? Yes, sir. I can tell the jury how you know him. Uh, I'm, I used to date his sister, and we, uh, me and his sister had some baby together. Did you and his sister live together? Yes, at one, one point. Back on October 6th of 21, did y'all live together? Yes. <clears throat> what was that address? Uh, I can't remember what I told my age. Uh, was it an apartment? Yes, sir. It was an apartment, though. Okay. They're in Arlington? Yes, sir. The apartment that was ultimately searched by police was that your apartment? Yes sir it was. Was it 4180 Lavos Street, apartment 1109? Yes sir. Okay. And you lived there with his sister? Yes sir. Did he live there with you? No sir. What kind of car did the defendant drive? Uh, I believe uh, a great charger, but they drive multiple vehicles because whatever they need to do to get back and forth to school. Hold on. So as you keep talking, you kind of get softer. softer. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I heard you, but talk all the way through, all the way to the back, okay? Please ask your next question. Right. You said he typically drove a gray charger, but sometimes he might drive somebody else's car. Yeah, his, his grandmother's vehicle. Okay. Hold on, hold on. Talk loud. You're talking in, no, hold on. You're talking into the microphone. I need you to project your voice. Oh, uh, uh. Talk to him without the microphone, okay? All right. All right, all right. first witness, Judge. You may. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm going to help you out. This thing moves. I oh, appreciate it. Right. Is that better? Yes, sir. Okay. Now then, you lived there with his sister. Did y'all have a child? Yes, sir. Uh, at the time, did y'all have a kid? Yes, sir, we did. Boy or girl? Girl. How old? Uh, she was newly born, basically. Oh, <coughs> not even one yet. Okay. Now then, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to show you what's been entered into evidence. It states 18B. Was this your gun? No, sir. Have you ever seen it before? No, sir. Was this gun kept at your apartment? No, sir. Did you keep or have any Glock magazines at your apartment? No, sir. So if they were found at your apartment, somebody else put them there? Yes, sir. And you're aware that the police searched your apartment the day of the shooting? Yes, sir. And that's where they found that gun? Yes, sir. I passed the witness. Well, they didn't tell me what they found in there, but whatever they found. 
They searched your apartment the day of the shooting. Yes, sir. I, yeah. You, you know that? <clears throat> yeah, I, I know that. Because uh, I had to take off work to actually come and let them in before they broke down the door. And whatever they pulled out that day is what they found? Yeah. I also had fire alarms too, so I didn't know what fire alarms they was. I thought it was just mine. Okay. They returned you yours? Yes, sir, they did. That Glock's not one of yours? Is no, it's not. And you saw the defendant's charger at your apartment? Uh, yes, sir. The gray charger? Yes, sir. Okay. And was it normally parked there? Uh, no. He didn't live with you? No. He didn't live in the same apartment complex? No, sir. Where did he live? Uh, with his grandmother. Where was that? Uh, in Mansfield. Past witness. Cross examination. Good morning, Deshaun. Good morning, ma'am. When this incident happened, you were at work, correct? Yes, ma'am. How far do you work from where you live? Uh, I, I'm really like mobile, so wherever my job is at the moment. And so I was really like almost two hours out. And you and Raven live together, correct? Yes, ma'am. And when you got there, Raven was there, correct? Uh, no. Did the doorbell ring that day? Did the, no. Okay, so where, so when you came back home, was Raven there? Yeah, I met her in the parking lot. Okay, and Raven is Tim's sister, correct? Yes. So Raven could have let him in, correct? Maybe. I don't know what she, I don't know what she was that day. And Tim doesn't have a key to your house, correct? I leave the key, so we have, I had a dog, so I leave my key on the back porch because I let people house sit in my house and I let my dog out so he won't use the bathroom inside the house. Because sometimes Raven do leave and go by her grandmother's house during the day so she can have assistance with the baby at the time. Was Raven at home when you went to work that morning? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Does Raven have a car? Uh, no, ma'am. And you would agree with me that if Raven needs to go somewhere and you're not around, it's either Miss Lily or it's Tim that picks her up, correct? Yes, ma'am. No further question. Okay. Any regret? No, sir. May this witness be excused? Subject to recall. Okay. And no objection from the defense. All right, you are released. If you get a call to come back, you'll have to come on back, okay? okay. Uh, hopefully that won't happen, but if it is, we'll see you then. Uh, thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you. Right. Please call your next witness. Steve, call Officer Newquist. Officer Newquist. testimony that you're about to give and the cause now on trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. All right. Come on up here and have a seat. Thank you. You can move the microphone at all, please do so. Okay. State your witness. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and tell me how you're employed? Uh, my name is Nicole Newquist. I'm currently employed with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office. 
prior to that, I was actually working for the Arlington crime scene uh, department. Can you speak up just a little bit? I'm sorry. My name is Nicole. I work with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office currently. Prior to that, I actually worked with the Arlington Police Department Crime Scene Unit. How long did you work as a crime scene officer? I was with Crime Scene for 11 years. So on October 6th of 21, you were a crime scene officer? Yes, sir. Can I approach the witness judge? Mm -hmm. For our purposes, what was your role in this case? Um, I handled uh, the suspect. Uh, I took uh, gunshot residue, collected his clothing. Um, I did uh, some evidence processing. When you say suspect, you're referring to the defendant? Yes, sir. What day did you uh, come in contact with him? Uh, it was October 6th, 2021. And about what time? Uh, about 13, 45 hours. For those who I'm been... sorry, uh, 1.45 p.m. Okay, 13.45 is military time. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm so used to using that. It's okay. Where did you come in contact with him at? Uh, he was at the North Police Station at that time. Do you know if he had turned himself in? I was told that he had. Okay, you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, sir. Okay, if my chair is one, two, three, four, and five going across the court to your left, what chair number is he in? Number five. Is he, what color suit is he wearing? He's wearing kind of a gray tan. <coughs> I'll take your word for it. Okay. All right. Now then, I'm going to show you some photographs. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what we marked as dates 142 through 145. Tell me if you recognize that individual. I do. Okay. What was the purpose of you taking photographs? Uh, to document who the individual was and so that I knew if I ever had to come testify that I could put a face with the evidence that I collected. Does it also document any injuries he has or does not have? Yes. Do these pictures that we just uh, identified barely accurate show the way he looked on October the 6th? Yes. Judge, we're going to offer states 142 through 145 inclusive. One forty two through one forty five are admitted. Permission to publish by holding? You may. Show you what this is. States one forty two, this front picture. Oh, right yes. We, did you see any visible injuries on his face or head? Uh, he had a little look like, contusion on the upper right side of his head. But that was it. Okay, one forty three is that the contusion you're referring to? Yes, sir. What else did you do? Um, with him or with the case in general? With him. Uh, with him, I collected gunshot residue samples. All right. Somebody may have seen that on TV, mm -hmm. but tell us what that, what that is and what that means for you. Um, what it is is it's we do three little stubs, one for each hand and one across the nose and cheeks. And it's got a little, it's kind of like a little stamper that has got a sticky end to it, and what we do is we stick it along the skin and it collects any gunshot uh, particles that may have been remaining from uh, firing a firearm. Is there any particular place on the hand that you want to run the, the uh, GSR on? We focus on the areas that are going to be closest to the gun, so like in the crook of a hand, 
um, along the back of the hand, the palm of the hand, and along the wrist. I'll show you. You marked as 18B. So the way you described it, if I'm holding mm -hmm. a handgun, you're going to run along the crook of my arm. Your gun would be correct. And along the wrist. Yeah, because it may blow back into that area. Because when the slide comes all the way back, you can get that on your wrist. Correct. I'm going to show what we've marked for identification purposes as stage 26. Do you recognize this? I do. What is it? Uh, this is the bag that I packaged the gunshot residue samples in. Now then, we see some red, I'm going to call it tape on there. Mm -hmm. That's y'all's? Yes, the red's ours. Because it says Arlington Police Department, right? Correct. And we see some yellow tape on there. Yes, sir. And whose is that? That would be the in, uh, company that processed it. In this case, it would be the uh, Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office that processed it. And we know that too because it says Tarrant County Medical Examiner on there. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So you package it, you seal it, it goes to the crime lab, they would then open it, do whatever testing they're going to do, and then reseal it with the yellow tape. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm now showing you states 26A. Do you recognize these? I do. Are those the actual collection, the three the collection? stubs that you just described for us? They are. Okay, and you have them labeled as well? I do. How do you have them labeled? Um, I put the case number on it, I put my item number on it, and then I also indicate where they came from, whether they came from the right hand, the left hand, or the face. And okay. I also put the individual that I collected them from. And you do that at the top? Yes. Okay. And you see all those markings and descriptions that you previously described on stage 26A? I do. <clears throat> Judge, we're going to offer 626A for all purposes and 626 for record only. Okay. All right. 26 is admitted for the record, 26A is admitted for all purposes. Commission published by Holt. You may. Each one's for the ones for the right hand, one's for the left, and one's for the face. Yes, sir. I mean, it literally, it's quite as simple as unscrewing the cap and then running the what we call tape. Yeah. And dabbing it to pick up whatever particles are on it. Okay. Uh, please remind the prosecutor to ask a question instead of testifying what it is. Yeah, please stop leading the witness. It is literally that simple. It is. It's just as simple as pulling the top off and dabbing it on the hands. so there's no contamination. Correct. You did other things in this case, like assist with packaging and things like that, is that correct? Correct. But what we're concerned about right now is just the GSR. Correct. Could you pass the witness? Okay. Cross-examination. Uh, I was at APD in the lab, and then that was it, yes. So when was the first time that you heard that something had occurred at Timothy? Uh, I got a phone call at 9.45 a.m. So you got the call at 9.45. What was the first thing you did after receiving that call? Uh, I was at home at the time, so the first thing I did was get ready for work and report to work. And during your time at work, you said at 1345 hours, correct? Yes. At what time did you learn that uh, uh, Timothy had turned his second? It would have been at 1345 hours. So, so no man, like, did you know that uh, his mom arranged for him to turn his second? I did not. And so you went to take pictures of Tim, correct? I did. And you said earlier uh, 
he talked about he had a contusion mm -hmm. on his uh, for, uh, temple, right? Yes. Define contusion. Uh, contusion is basically like a bruise. Okay. But it involves uh, injury, blood capillaries are torn, correct? Yes. So would you say that somebody getting stomped on the head causing a contusion, could, could cause a contusion, correct? It could possibly. And would you agree that stomping somebody in the head could cause death or serious bodily injury? I'm joking, it comes from speculation. It's over. You may ask me. Yes. And at any time after you photographed him, was the jail staff alerted that he needs to see anybody for injury? I don't know. So it's been marked as State Exhibit 26A. This is a GSR uh, results, uh, the testing of his clothes, et cetera? It is a sample that I collected. Okay. And on this, did you label this? I did. And is that your writing, your name? The printed out portion is. And your badge number? Yes. 2774? Yes, ma'am. And on each one of these particular vials, what did, uh, what is he, what's he charged with? Aggravated assault. Okay. Aggravated assault, deadly weapon, correct? Yes. And if you know, that's a second degree felony, right? I am not aware of that. That's not my jurisdiction. So he wasn't charged with attempted capital murder? At that time, no. So once you collected that, made the label with an aggravated assault on it, what did you take those out of? What did you put those out of? Uh, once I collected them, I put them in the brown paper bags, sealed them up, and secured them in our locker until I submitted them to our property department. Is it there at uh, 401 West Fairmont? Uh, no, it's at 620 West Division Street. And it remained there until today? It remained there until the detective requested that it be submitted to the lab, in which case it was transported to the lab. And which lab would that be? At uh, the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office. Do you know what date that was done? No, ma'am. Redirect? Yes, sir. Once you package those stubs, you put them in your business locker? Yes, sir. Secured area? Yes. Nobody else can get into it? Nope. I can't walk back there and just pull stuff off while, even if I wanted to? No. Okay. This counsel was asking you a question about what offense you put on your uh, documentation. At 145 on October 6th, how many victims were you aware of? I. To be honest, I don't remember how many victims had been involved in it. I knew there were multiple victims. And is it your decision as to what offense somebody's charged with? No, I usually go with the first uh, um, offense that I'm told when it originally occurs, and it, sometimes it changes later on. So the grand jury in this office makes decisions on what someone should be charged with? Correct. The grand jury approves it, and they indict somebody for that offense? Correct. That's what you Jeffrey, do you recall who the lead detective is on this case? Um, give me just a second. No, ma'am, I don't. 
But the lead detective in this case, or detectives, they made the decision for those aggravated child death. Fiction or relevance? Yeah. I've let y'all go through that line of questioning, but it is irrelevant. It's the same. Okay. Okay. Any redirect? No, sir. All right. You may be excused. Thank you.
Please call your next witness. They would call Mateo the front. Mateo what? So you're gonna make me push it. <laughs> we'll wait and see. Do you solemnly swear and affirm the testimony that you're about to give in the cause now on trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth stuff you got? I do. All right. Have a seat here. Would you please um, say and then spell your first and last name? Spell it slowly, please. My name is Matteo Serfontaine, spelled M-A-T-E-O, S-E-R-F-O-N-T-E-I-N. Thank you, sir. Stay your witness. So, can I just call you Mateo? Yes, sir. Okay. So, I've been butchering your last name. It's a common thing that happens. It's okay. Right. I think a lot of last name Walsh, so I deal with everybody else's name that I think. All right. How are you employed and what do you do? I'm currently employed at the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office as a firearm and tool mark examiner. What does that mean? That means I examine any firearm-related evidence that's submitted to the lab for examination. What education and qualifications do you have that allow you to do that job? Uh, in 2006, I obtained my Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Stellenbosch in South Africa. In 2007, I joined the South African Police Service, through which I successfully completed a three-year in-service training program that qualified me as a fully trained forensic firearms examiner. In 2011, I moved to South Dakota where I work for the Attorney General's office, specifically the Division of Criminal Investigation. And in 2019, I moved down to Texas, where I currently work. Why in the world did you go to South Dakota? That's where a job was. It's cold up there. I'm well aware of it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hot here, but at least it's not cold. I'll take that. Okay. To maintain your job, is there any uh, continued education that you have to do or any proficiency t testing that you must maintain to keep your current job at the medical examiner's office? Yes, sir. And tell the jury what that is. We get proficiency tested in multiple disciplines and uh, continuing education just helps us to keep abreast of new developments in the field, new techniques or new equipment. Tell the jury what proficiency testing is. Proficiency testing is where they see if you are still proficient or competent in doing the examinations that we provide. And how do they do that? We usually use a vendor, an outside vendor that submits tests to a bunch of labs and then we complete the test and we send the answers back to them and then they'll let us know if you pass or fail. They basically send you what is the known answers to them. They'll send you the, the gun or the showcase more than it be, let you test it and examine it and then you send them the answer and they'll compare your answer to what they know the answer should be. Correct. And if you did well and passed, you get to keep the job. If you don't, you don't get to keep the job. Something like that, yeah. Since you still have your job, I think it you passed. Yes, sir. Okay. Now then, the T 
Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office in the firearm section, do they have any certifications uh, through the Texas uh, Science, uh, Forensic Science Commission? Uh, well, the, the crime lab at the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office is accredited by ANIB and by the Texas Forensic Science Commission. And the day that you did the testing, or in this case, they certainly were had a certification as well, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So walk us through how you would do the examination on the shell case. Uh, first, when we receive the packaging, we make sure that the packaging is in a sealed condition. Uh, we open the packaging and then we document the condition of the evidence. So shell casings might have uh, trace evidence such as blood. Then we document the class characteristics of um, the casing itself, which could be the caliber, and also the class characteristics of what the firearm imparted onto that fired cartridge case. Tell the jury what class characteristics mean. Class characteristics are predetermined features that a firearms manufacturer wants to have in his firearm. These include uh, types of machining or just distinct features. For example, the firing pin aperture, which is a hole cut in the slide of the pistol through which the firing pin moves, can be circular, uh, teardrop shaped, or rectangular. Caliber is also a class characteristic, so we evaluate those and then if class characteristics are different, we can immediately conclude that it's two different firearms. If the class characteristics are the same, then we have to look at the individual or unique characteristics to see if it was fired in this specific firearm. How does a, a mass-produced firearm have individual characteristics? Uh, individual characteristics happens incidental during the manufacturing process, unlike the class characteristics which are predetermined and measurable. Uh, this is due to the fact that metals are not homogenous. There's uh, impurities in it. There could be uh, bubbles in the metal. Uh, the tool as well has imperfections on the edge of it. So as the tool is moving over the piece, be it the slide or uh, any component of the firearm, those marks are unpredictable and they change all the time. They become individual to that particular firearm? Yes, sir. What did you examine in this case? Uh, in this case, I examined a firearm, uh, cartridge cases, fired bullet jackets, a lead core, a fired bullet, and a fired bullet jacket fragment. Okay. Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to show you what we've admitted as states. 18B, do you recognize this firearm? I do. Did you examine that firearm? Yes, sir. And when was that? Uh, I received the firearm on March 2nd and July 5th. And that's when you did your examinations? Yes, sir. Okay. So when you get ready to examine this firearm, do you see if it's a functioning firearm first? Yes, the first thing I do, uh, just like with the cartridge cases, I check for trace evidence, hairs, fibers, paint, blood. Uh, then we do a preliminary function check, which means not firing it, no ammunition. Uh, in this case, with the firearm, you check if the barrel is obstructed or if there are any cracks. You check if the safety features work the way it should, um, if the trigger works the way it should. And then after that, uh, after it's established that the firearm is functional, we test fired it into a water tank. And that's just to get bullets that's in a pristine condition so we can use that for comparison purposes. It also gives you a shell casing that you can compare to other shell casings. Yes, sir. Okay. Was this firearm functional? Yes, sir. Now then, since I take it you, uh, you fired this gun, can you walk us through the process of how you go back to you want to fire this gun? What would you have to do? If I have it at the lab now? At the lab anywhere. What's, what's the process? So uh, this firearm came with a magazine. I loaded two cartridges in the magazine, uh, inserted it into the firearm, pointed the firearm into the shooting tank, pulled the slide back and released it so that a cartridge from the magazine is fed into the firearm. I squeezed the trigger, it discharged, it extracted and ejected the fired cartridge case and fed a new cartridge from the magazine into uh, the firearm, 
and I repeated the process, and uh, that showed that the firearm functions the way it was designed. You also talked about safety features. Is there any safety features particular to a Glock? Uh, yes. What are they? Uh, there are a few safety features. The first one is a uh, trigger block, which is connected to the trigger. It prevents inadvertent movement of the trigger rearwards. The second feature is a firing pin block, which is inside of the slide. The firing pin is what's released and hits the back of a cartridge to detonate it and discharge the bullet. The firing pin block prohibits the firing pin from moving and hitting the uh, cartridge. Then there's also a disconnect safety. That safety is uh, twofold. It prevents the firearm from firing in full automatic or firing when it's out of battery. Out of battery means when the slide is not locked forward and it prevents the uh, buildup of gases towards the back and could potentially blow up the gun or injure the shooter. And then the last safety is the Glock drop action safety, which is a safety design that the manufacturers put in the farm to make sure that it doesn't discharge when you drop it. If I use the term trigger pull, does that mean anything to you? Yes. What does trigger pull mean? An amount of force needed to release the firing pin uh, to fire. Okay. If I use the term double action only or double action, does that mean anything to you? Yes. What do those two terms mean? So you get two types of actions uh, regarding pistols. Generally, you get single action and double action. Single action is uh, when you have to manually cock the hammer of a firearm. Um, so for example, the cowboy movies where you see them pulling the hammer back and shooting like that, that's single action. Double action is when you pull the trigger and it cocks the hammer and releases it in one movement. Which one is this one? Uh, we describe it as a double action, but it's more like a hybrid action because the firing pin is partially pushed back and then released, and not just released as in a single action. Okay. Is there anything about the, the length of trigger pull in the Glock when you first begin to pull it? Yeah, I mean, you have a small, what we call, creep until it reaches the point where if you pull it any further, it will discharge. Okay. Permission to publish, Judge? May. All right. Do you see this area right here? Yes, sir. Okay, that, that little button right on top of the trigger, what is, what is that? That's the trigger safety. What does that mean? Uh, that is to prevent the inadvertent rearward movement of the trigger unless it, uh, that safety is depressed. So when I begin, at first I put enough pressure to even get past that trigger safety. There's not a lot of pressure just to move it back, but yes. But then you then continue to pull the trigger. You have to deactivate that to pull the trigger all the way rearward, yes. Okay, and so what is the trigger pull weight for this firearm? Uh, it was between 5.3 and 5.8 pounds. Okay. And then for it to continue to fire again, do I have to let off the trigger? Yes. I mean, you said it's not fully auto, so I can't just pull the trigger back one time and it's going to keep firing. No. Okay, so I have to let off. Let go and squeeze again, yes. And keep doing that. Yes. So if, if I fire six times, at six times I have to... Pull the trigger, let go, pull the trigger, let go, pull the trigger, let go, pull the trigger, let go. I think there's one more, pull the trigger, and let go. Yes. I'll show you states 18D. Do you recognize this? Yes, sir. What are those? Uh, these are the test fired standards that I uh, collected when I test fired the gun to check for functionality and also uh, use the test fired standards for microscopic comparison purposes. Now we didn't open that, but tell us what, what is in there. Uh, in this envelope are four bullets and four cartridge cases. Can we say, for laymen, when they think of bullet, they mean they think of a whole bullet. Is that what you're talking about, or you're talking about just the projectile itself? No. So. Uh, a cartridge, also known as ammunition, consists of a case, a primer, the powder, and the bullet. When I talk about the bullet, the bullet is the projectile that leaves the barrel and hits the target. Um, the cartridge case is what's ejected uh, after it was fired. So those are your, your test fires that you use to compare to everything else? Yes, sir. Now you said you use a microscope to do it. Yes, sir. You don't just pick up and look with a naked eye and say these two things match. You actually dim under a microscope. Them. Yes, sir.
many shell casings did you compare to that Glock? Six total. Okay. How many projectiles did you compare to that Glock? Uh, there were three fired bullet jackets and one fired bullet. Okay. I'm going to show you Stacy's exhibit uh, one. First of all, do you recognize Stacy's exhibit one? Yes. Okay. This is the packaging that was one of the shell casings that you compared. Uh, for uh, shell casing that was labeled by our lab number two, yes. Okay. For the FBI, it's labeled number one, but for you, it's number two. Yes. And stakes exhibit 1B is the actual shell casing. I'm going to show you Stacey's exhibit number two. Do you recognize that packaging again? Yes, sir. And for the jury's benefit, the yellow tape on it, that is from you? Yes, sir. Okay. And as you previously described, you'll check the packaging and make sure it hasn't been tampered with, it's sealed appropriately, and if it has been, you document that and you may return it, but if it hasn't been, then you continue your examination. Yes, sir. And all these items that we'll be talking about, that's the process you went through, and everything was sealed appropriately, and was labeled correctly and you proceeded with your testing. Yes, sir. Okay. In looking at states two, there's another envelope that's been labeled as 2A. You recognize that as well? Yes, sir. Showcasing associated with that, you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay. Show you stage three. You recognize this packaging? Yes, sir. Same question, same answers as far as the packaging. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Same thing with 3A. 3B being the shell casing. Yes, sir. There's a record of states five. You recognize this the packaging for that? If you don't, that's fine. Yeah, usually with the packaging that we receive, we have our own uh, label on it. And I don't, I don't see our label on this or me resealing this package. So. Okay, that's okay. Let me show you something. This has been previously admitted as having been collected at the same location where the shooting occurred. And it's been described as a lake fragment. How would you describe that? Uh, it appears to be multiple lead fragments, yes. Would that prevent you from being able to do any testing to determine what firearm fired these lead fragments? Uh, if these lead fragments are from a jacketed bullet, then there's nothing I can do with them. Those are in too many pieces. And they also don't make contact with the barrel. Explain that to the jury. Why don't leg fragments make contact with the barrel? So with jacketed bullets, uh, there's a jacket uh, on the outside that's usually made from copper or brass. The jacket uh, is filled with lead. The lead gives it weight to travel forward. So um, it's almost like an M&M candy. The color part of the candy is what makes contact with the barrel and what's inside the candy does not and we look at the marks that's imparted from the barrel on the jacket. So, uh, in the jacketed bullet, when we get lead fragments, since they don't make contact with the barrel, there's not much we can do with them. You didn't do an examination of these lead fragments? No, I did not. I'll show you state specific six. Do you recognize this one? Yes. You see your yellow tape on it? Yeah. Okay. 
In 6A, conditional packaging, you recognize that? Yes, sir. Again, we see your yellow tape and your initials. Yes, sir. Okay. And 6B, the copper jacket that you were describing earlier, do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Now I'm going to show you state 7, 7A, and 7B. Now then, we do see your yellow tape on this packaging. Is that yes, correct? sir. Do you recognize state 7B? Yes, sir. Okay, now, how would you describe that? Uh, this is a lead core. Were you able to do any testing or examination on that? No, sir. Yeah. Show you states eight. Again, you recognize your yellow tape? Yes, sir. Okay. Eight A additional packaging inside. Again, you recognize your yellow tape? Yes, sir. Your initials, your date. Yes. Sir. In what has we've identified as state eight B, do you recognize it? Yes, sir. How would you describe that? Uh, it is a fire bullet jacket. Uh, in this instance, it's in two pieces. Uh, since when I received the jacket, it was very mangled and folded over each other. And we have to fold it open to see if there are any marks that we can compare. And uh, during this process, a piece broke off, but it was received as a single piece, as a fire bullet jacket. So now I'm going to show you state style. Same questions. The questions and answers are all the same as far as the packaging go, especially on anything that we see yellow tape on. Yes, sir. States 9, and now I'm showing you states 9A. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's a glass case with a shell casing in it, and the glass case itself has your yellow tape on it, your initials, and your date from when you did the examination? Yes, sir. <coughs> now I've shown you the week marks in states of number 10. Again, we see your yellow tape on the outside. Yes, sir. We've labeled the states 10A. Do you recognize that? Yes, sir. That's just one of the showcasings that you examined. Yes, sir. Again, the yellow tape on the glass, that's, that's from you. Yes, sir. And your initials and date are on here as well. Yes, sir. Show you what we've labeled the states exhibit 11. 11A, do you recognize that? Yes, sir. That's a, a showcasing that you examined. Yes, sir. And again, you recognize your yellow tape, your date, your initials on there as well. Yes, sir. Now, shall we have entered to Evans to state to 12? 12A and 12B. Do you recognize 12B? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Now, again, the, the packaging is 12 and 12A. That's got your initials and your marks, your yellow tape on there as well. Yes, sir. Okay. And you recognize 12B, is that correct? Yes, sir. And what is it? It's a fired bullet jacket. Did you do any comparison to these items to 18B that's clock 45? Yes, sir. Did you come to any conclusions? Yes, sir. What conclusions did you come to in reference to that clock 45 to those six shell casings? Uh, I could identify that the cartridge cases were fired from the block firearm. How were you able to do that? Uh, well. As I mentioned earlier, the class characteristics were the same, and then when comparing the individual or unique characteristics, there was uh, enough agreement in those marks for me to conclude that they were fired in the firearm. In reference to any of the uh, copper jackets, were you able to make any or draw conclusions as to whether those come from that firearm? I could not. They were inconclusive. They had agreement of class characteristics, but there was not enough agreement of unique or individual characteristics to identify it to the Glock pistol. When you say there was agreement as to class characteristics, tell the jury what you mean by that. So class characteristics is predetermined features that's measurable that the manufacturer wants to have in their firearm. Uh, in this instance, uh, the rifling profile was eight right hand twist, and the uh, the manufacturing process that they used is called polygonal rifling. So what does that word mean? Uh, you get conventional or polygonal rifling. So rifling are the helical grooves that's put inside of the barrel to put spin on the bullet. Just like a quarterback stabilizing a football when he throws a spiral. Uh, it can go either left twist or right twist. Uh, conventional has got sharp shoulders and it's usually by means of a cutting process that they uh, impart these marks into the inside of the barrel. With polygonal, in this case, it's a process they call hammer forging. So they have a mandrel with the profile of the rifling on the inside of the barrel, and then they hammer the outside to smash the inside of the barrel basically onto the mandrel and they remove it. Those polygonal rifling characteristics are rounded and smooth. And there's no distinct shoulders that you can see, unlike conventional rifling, which got uh, distinct shoulders. So looking at the copper jackets, you said they had the same class characteristics as that Glock 45. Is there other firearms that have that same class characteristic or is it a limited number? Uh, so doing a general rifling characteristic search in the database, uh, there were only four models of Glock pistol and three models of Bursa uh, brand pistols that have the same class characteristics as uh, this lock. And the lead cores you were able to make any determination of? Nothing on the lead core, no. When you fire a firearm, uh, will you sometimes see smoke come from the firearm? Uh, from the muzzle, yeah. And does, if you're in, indoors firing a firearm, does Fire multiple times, but that smoke tend to accumulate. Yes. Okay. Explain that to the jury. Why does that happen? Well, when firing a firearm, uh, the powder ignites inside of the cartridge case and it builds up a lot of pressure and gas, and that propels the bullet uh, down the barrel. Now, it's not just the bullet that comes out of the muzzle, it's partially burnt and unburnt powder, as well as carbonaceous materials that's in the form <coughs> of vaporous lead, and th that's the cloud that you would see. And the more times you fire you got indoors, the more of those times you'll see. Yes. Okay. Pass the witness. All right. Cross examination. Yes, um, briefly, sir. What's your first name again? Mateo. Mateo. Okay. So the Glock has a safe action system, correct? Uh, that's the, the drop safety, yes. And would you say that it has a pretty fast reset? I mean, I, we don't measure that. Uh, reset just means that you have to release the trigger so that you, when you pull it, it releases the firing pin again. And so it depends basically on just how many 
how fast you pull the trigger, correct? Well, you have to release it a certain amount. So, and like I said, we don't measure that distance. No further questions. Okay. Miss, will this be excused? Excuse from the state. Yes, yes. All right. You may be excused. Thank you for your testimony. My next witness. They're called Vicki Hall. Ms. Hall. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in the cause now in trial? Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I hope you guys. I do. All right. Thank you. You may have a seat. If you need to adjust that microphone. Please do so. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> in reference to this case, you uh, did some testing. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Who did you? When did you do the testing, and where did you work? Um, the testing was completed in February of two, 2022. At the time, I worked at the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office and Forensic Laboratories in the Trace Evidence Section. Have you since retired? Yes, sir, I have. How long did you work or do forensic work? Um, in total, I worked in forensics for over 32 years. Ten years was at Tarrant County, and prior to that, I worked for Dallas County for 22. So you came to us last? Yes, in the last 10 years was at Tarrant County. So you liked working for Tarrant County better than Dallas, right? <laughs> I better not answer that question. <laughs> All right. So what training education did you have that allowed you to do forensic work? Well, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry, as well as a Master's in Analytical Chemistry. I've attended numerous workshops and training seminars in Forensic <coughs> Sciences including training courses at the FBI Academy. I've participated in annual proficiency testing, as well as training and training of several coworkers in areas of trace evidence. And I was the technical leader while I was at Tarrant County. For us, you did the testing for the GSR, gunshot residue. That is correct. And okay, what training education do you have that allowed you to do that? Besides my education and my degrees, I participated in on-the-job training um, with coworkers. Um, there was a dedicated training plan. I did attend uh, training classes at the FBI Academy specifically for gunshot residue analysis and also went to several uh, workshops in that area. I went to uh, a company that, that manufactured our instruments went to their campuses and participated in training with them as well. And you've had the opportunity to testify in reference to the gunshot residue before, is that correct? Yes, I have. Many or a few times? Well over 600 times. We'll make a 601 prove that. <laughs> Something um, like that. You mentioned proficiency testing, I and mean, the jury's already heard what that is. Um, prior to the, the testing that you did in this case, you had done your proficiency testing and you had passed, I take it? Yes, I did. And at the time that you did your testing, the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office, did it hold any certifications or accreditations as it related to gunshot residue testing? Yes, the, the laboratory itself was accredited, um, and then I also hold, held a state license through the um, Texas Department of Public Safety. And they had the same accreditation from the same agency? Y yes. Just my first witness? Yeah. show you what we've already admitted this takes 26 26a 
Tell me if you recognize these. Yes, sir, I do. Okay. Those are stubs to collect GSR. Yes, uh, 26 is the envelope that they, or kit that it was contained in, and 26A is a plastic bag that contains three gunshot residue stubs. And you recognize the bag? Um, yes, the, I recognize the stubs. They have our case number, item numbers, and my initials, as well as the item 26, which is the packaging. And again, we see uh, yellow tape on there from the medical examiner's office that we from y'all. Yes, this yellow tape is the evidence tape where I sealed the packaging once my analysis was complete. And the jury's already heard that when you initially get the packaging, it, it's sealed. And if it's not, you document that and may even return it to the agency because it could have been tampered with. That's correct. I make notations of whether the evidence is sealed or not upon my receipt. Um, when I receive it from our evidence registration department, um, it must be in a sealed condition. And then once I start my analysis, I do notate the seal. It was sealed properly? Yes. And when you began to look at the stubs, the, the caps were on them correctly? Yes. So there's no issue about cross-contamination from one stub to the other? Not once it reached me, no. Okay. Now then, so how would you begin an analysis in reference to stage 26A? Well, once I notated the packaging, I opened this brown paper sack, inventoried the items, which were three GSR stubs, and then I labeled them with our case number, item number, and initials and date of exam. And then I used a, just a regular stereo microscope and looked at the surface of these stubs, which is a thumbtack that looks like it has double-sided sticky tape on it. And just to look for any obvious residue that might be present, is there a lot of dirt or fibers that might be present, and then notated that. Um, once that was complete, then I proceeded to apply a very fine layer of carbon on the surface of these stoves, and that's for the type of testing that we do. I don't want an electrical charge to build up, and so that carbon kind of gives it a grounding effect. And then what do you do? Then I take the stoves and I place them inside of our instrument, which is a scanning electron microscope with an energy dispersive x-ray detector. It's also known as an SEM. Um, once I placed them inside the chamber, I then went through our procedure to analyze the surface of each of these stubs as well as a blank that was also included. The blank is something I add to the analysis. It's a blank stub to make sure that there's, um, through the process, that there's no contamination from one stub to another or from any external source. Right. The instrument that is used is based on a valid scientific theory. Yes. And it properly applies that valid scientific theory. Yes. And you're properly trained on the operation of that instrument to, to apply that scientific theory. Yes, I am. All right. Now, then you talked about you'll take the stub and you'll run it through the instrument. You'll then put a, a blank before and after each one to make sure there's no contamination. That's correct. I, I run the blank sample <coughs> with these stubs. I run a control sample that I know has known GSR particles or a known um, particle that contains the elements I'm looking for before this, this, these samples are run and at the end to make sure the instrument is working properly. It also ensures that there's no contamination either from one stub to the next or from any previous work that's been done. Correct. That's the purpose for that blank sample. And the known sample lets you know the instrument's working or correctly. Correct. Okay. So what are you looking for? For gunshot residue, I'm looking for what we call particles, and these particles are very tiny. They're in the micron size, meaning you can fit 40 or 80 of them <coughs> side by side, and they'd be the width of a human hair. So they are not, not visible to the naked eye. You need a very high-powered microscope to actually see these particles. So during the analysis, it searches for any particles that are present. Now, they may be gunshot residue particles, or they may be something that a person comes into contact normally in their environment. You might find gold, silver, or platinum from jewelry, or things off of your keys, or depending on what your occupation are, it, what your occupation is, you might have residue on your hands. And so it searches the surface of each stub and will notate a particle that's present. And then it determines the chemical composition of that individual particle. 
this analysis will print out a list of all those particles. And there may be 100 particles on a stub, or they may, there may be 20,000 particles. It just depends on how dirty and how well that sample was collected from a person's hands or other surface. So I'm looking for particles that contain the elements of antimony, barium, and lead. Those three elements in that combination are what's characteristic of gunshot residue. So I like to find these individual particles with those three elements in order to say that those characteristics have been met. And why is that important, just those three? Well, those are the major components of the ammunition primer. So within an ammunition cartridge, at the base of it you have a very small chemical mixture known as the primer. Most primer mixtures have those three elements I mentioned, antimony, barium, and lead. So during the firing process, that chemical mixture explodes, which causes gases to build up and the burning of the gunpowder, which forces the bullet down the barrel and toward the target. But within that cloud of smoke you see coming from a gun when it's fired is this residue coming from that chemical explosion. And within that cloud you have these very tiny particles. And the ones that I'm looking for have those three elements. Are there other ways to have a combination of those three particular particles outside of the from a gunshot? Those three elements on a single particle is is not very common in the environment. It has been found on rare occasions on, on a brake lining, on a car in Europe. You may find it anytime a, a primer is used. Some, some airbags will use a primer, so sometime if an airbag is deployed, there might be these same, same type of residue particles um, coming from that. Some old construction tools like nail guns would use primers, and sometimes if you used a nail gun that used primers, you might get these same type of particles. But outside of those, is really going to be limited to primers from, from shooting a gun. That's correct. <clears throat> in looking at the stub for the right hand, and the, take the stub for the left hand and for the face, were you able to come up with any results? Yes, I was. In 26, item 26, like I said, there was three steps, one from the, collected from the left hand, one from the right hand, and one from the face. And the results were that I, I did not find any particles that contained all three of these elements. I did find numerous particles that had two of the three elements or combinations that we consider consistent with gunshot residue. So they could be from gunshot residue or they could be from some other environmental sources. For example, on my item 12.1, which is the stub from the left hand, I confirmed the presence of one lead antimony particle and three barium aluminum particles, which is consistent with GSR, and also one barium calcium silicon, which we also find in gunshot residue, but can be from an environmental source as well. On the stub from the right hand of Mr. Timothy Simpkin, I found one antimony barium aluminum particle, three barium aluminum particles, and one barium calcium silicon. On the stub from the face, there were two lead antimony particles and one barium aluminum particles. So these particles that were found on the stubs collected from Mr. Simpkins were consistent with GSR, but I can't say absolutely that's where, where they originated from. Because you only had two out of the three and not all three together. That's correct. I either had two of the three or some other varying combinations. And you also had some other particles consistent with, but it just wasn't part of the main three. That's correct. But you had particles on all three stubs. Yes, I had consistent particles on all three samples. <coughs> Pass what? Pass examination. Judge me, she'd be excused to go back for a moment. Is there any reason that she can't be excused? No. Okay. All right, you're excused from trial. Thank you. Thank you. To go back to retirement. Uh, <laughs> All right.
right, please call your next witness. Shania McNeely. Shania McNeely. Yes. Here, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in the cause now and trial to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, if you got it, all right, you can lower your hand. Come see here. Make sure that microphone fits you. Now, I'll ask you to do one thing. Even though you've got a microphone, I need you to speak real loud so that people in the back can hear you. What it does is make sure that you pronounce your words, okay? Okay. You're real soft. I need you to talk louder. Try again. Okay. Is that loud? No, it's not. Talk loud. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right. State your witness. Can you tell me your name, please? Michelle Megan. Okay. That's good. I can hear you. Keep your voice up, okay? Pull, pull that microphone closer. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask you some questions about what happened at Timberview High School on October the 6th of 2021, okay? Okay. You were a student there at the time, correct? Yes, ma'am. What grade were you in? Um, I was a junior, I believe. A junior? Yes. Okay. So you are now uh, about, are you in college? Uh, I graduated, I started college in August. And you're going to be studying nursing? Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, what class were you in that morning? Whose class? Mrs. Altman's class. Mrs. Altman's? Okay, keep your voice up. I can barely hear you. Okay. So, I'm going to ask you some questions about what happened that morning in the class. All right? Yes, ma'am. Did a fight break out that morning in the classroom? Yes, ma'am. And was it between two boys? Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, ma'am. So, you know, you're doing the best you can. You're kind of mumbling. I need you to talk to the back. Don't talk through the microphone. Talk all the way to um, my deputy back there, okay? Try again. Say yes, ma'am, real loud. Yes, ma'am. That's better. Thank you. Go ahead. What are the names of the two students that were in a fight? Uh, Zach and Timothy. Okay. And do you recognize Timothy in the courtroom here today? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell me where he's sitting? On the back of me. See at the very end of these two tables? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So tell me what happened in the classroom that you saw. Um, so, I, so I'm in the front of the classroom and I heard a knock on the door and the teacher wanted to go open the door and it was Zach. And then when she opened the door, they were talking for a little minute and then Zach burst in and the fight just started. All right. So you heard some talking between Zach and Tim? No, the teacher and Zach. Okay. 
because he came in late. Okay. And then the fight started. Is that what you said? Um, he burst in and the fight just started. Okay. And then what did you see during the fight? Um, a fight. <laughs> a lot of punching, throwing, stuff like that. Were people taking their phones out to videotape? Yes, ma'am. Were you videotaping? Yes, ma'am. Is that something that students do when there's a fight? Yes, ma'am. At some point, did you stop videotaping? Yes, ma'am. Why? It just got too hectic. Like, I was scared, so I exited the classroom. Did you ever see a weapon? Yes, ma'am. Who had the weapon? Timothy. Okay, tell me about that. Um, so I, at this point, I'm out of the classroom, and then the, the fight stopped, and then Timothy pulled out a gun, and then I just ran. I don't know what happened after that. I just ran. Where did you see him, or did you see him get the gun? Yes, ma'am. From where? Like right here. Right. When you say right here, where is that? Like under his pants. Not under his pants, but like, you know, like... Waist? Yeah, he pulled it out from right there. <laughs> And is that when you started running? Yes, ma'am. Did other students start running? I don't know. I was only worried about myself. Okay. When you said running, were you going <coughs> pretty fast? I think, I hope, not fast enough, but... <laughs> okay. Do you remember what you were wearing that day? Yes, ma'am. I had on a black shirt. It said Outer Banks, and I had on some biker shorts with some black Crocs. Black Crocs. All right. Uh, was your hair long or short? It was long. Okay. So when you ran out of the classroom, do you remember where you went? Yes, ma'am. I went to the right of me. Um, it's a glass window, and then it's a staircase. And I went down the staircase to go to the classroom that was on the okay. first floor. When you got to the end of that hallway, um, did you feel anything? Yes, ma'am. Um, so when I was running, I felt a quick shot. It was really fast. It was just a really fast burn. And then that's when I stopped. But a teacher kept telling me, like, we got to go. We have to go. So, but in that moment, I was, I, I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't check until I got oh, to the Slow down just a bit. Oh. Okay, so you didn't know until you got to what? The classroom. Okay, talk real loud. The classroom. Okay. So you, you felt a sharp pain? In that moment, yes. And a teacher um, said, let's keep going to you? Yes, he was trying to get me out of the hallway. Did you find out later why you had a sharp pain? Um, I assumed that I didn't know what it was in the moment. But later, did you find out what it was? Yes, ma'am. What was it? I was grazed by the bullet. Okay. Um, where were you grazed? On my side, my left side, of my stomach. Of your stomach? Okay. Were you still able to keep walking or running? Um, I didn't run, but I was able to get to the classroom, yes ma'am. Okay. Did you go downstairs? Yes ma'am. Right. And eventually, did you have to go to the doctor to get treated for that gunshot wound? Yes ma'am, that same day. The same day? Did you go to Arlington Memorial Hospital or where? I'm not sure. Um, how did you get up? Did you get a hold of a parent or somebody? Yes, ma'am. Who was that? Uh, my mom. Okay. When did you When did you get a hold of your mom? After like five minutes, it happened. She was at She was at work, so I kept trying to reach her. But after a while, I got a hold of her. Okay. Was your mom allowed to come to the school to come and get you, or what happened? Um. So I got. When I left the school, I left on the ambulance, but my mom was there. At the, at the school? Yes, ma'am. Did she ride with you in the ambulance? No, ma'am. Did she have to follow the ambulance? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> now, after this happened, did you go back to that school? No, ma'am. Did you have to switch schools? I wanted to switch schools. Okay. Pass the witness. <coughs> Cross-examination. <coughs> 
Good morning, Shania. How are you? Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. So, on cross examination, you mentioned that that just burst in this office classroom. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when that happened, did you see Tim fight back? I wasn't paying attention, but I know if after a while with the fight, I seen him. He didn't fight back. He was just laying on because he was on the floor. But I, that's the only time I didn't see him fight back. Did you see Zach stomp him? On the floor, yes. Why did you stop to, why did you decide to stop recording the fight? It was too scary, it got too serious. Was the classroom loud during the fight? Very. Did any teachers come in to help break up the fight? Yes, ma'am. Do you remember who those people were? No, ma'am. Uh, did you see a teacher push that? No, ma'am. How did the fight end? Um, I'm not sure. And when you mentioned that it was just too hectic and scary, why were you so scared in the classroom? Um, because most fights, you it gets broken up fast. But that one, it was just someone on the floor stomping too much. Like the fight wasn't in one setting; it was all around the classroom. So. Okay, and so when you were able to run out of the classroom, did you feel a, a fast burn or a fast pain? A burn. Okay, fast burn. And how long did it take you to find out what happened to you? When I, when I went to the classroom that the teacher was trying to get me to. And at what moment did you decide to run out of the classroom? When I seen the gun. Uh, defense pass witness. Okay. I think further, Your Honor. Ms. Witness, may excuse? Yes, Your Honor. You may be excused. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Your Honor, you should finally be excused. Yes, ma'am, I just excuse her. Thank you. Uh -huh. <clears throat> what? Please call your next witness. Stay with all Detective Wheatley. Hold on, just a second. Um, He's a short witness for us. Okay, there you go. All right, Detective Lee. Please uh, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give in the cause now in trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, we got it. Yes, sir, I do. Oh, can I have a seat here? Please make sure that the microphone is just you. Try to speak slowly and loudly so everybody understands. Yes, sir. And uh, it's your witness. All right. Can you introduce yourself to the jury and tell them about your employee? Yes, sir. My name is Sean Wheatley. And I'm a detective in our violent crime unit with the Oregon Police Department. How long have you been a police officer? Uh, a little over 31 years. All of that with Arlington? Yes, sir. You're the primary detective on this case? Yes, sir. Okay. On October the 6th of 21, did you have an occasion to go to the high school uh, where the shooting occurred? Uh, I was assigned a case. I wound up responding to the hospital, uh, but it was referenced to the shooting that happened at the high school. But ultimately, did you ever go to the high school? Yes, I did. Did you ever go down that hallway where the shooting happened? Yes, I did. Did you go 
Go down there while the evidence is uh, still out? No, I did not. Okay. Do you see the photographs collected by the FBI? Yes. Do you see the evidence collected by the FBI? Yes. You had an occasion to interview multiple witnesses? Yes. You had an occasion to listen to those witnesses describe where they were when the shooting happened, where they were as they fled the classroom, is that fair? Yes. You've seen still photos from a school video, is that correct? Yes. You've compared that video to the statements you received from the witnesses and they correspond to each other. Yes. For example, Coach Boyd says, I come down the, the hallway into the classroom. You see Coach Boyd come down the hallway and go in the classroom. Yes. Coach Boyd says, hey, I took off running. Going There's down. no object to leaving. I'm attempting yeah. to lay a perfect judge. Yeah, um, that's a sustained turn up over. Okay. <clears throat> you were able to compare testimonies and statements to this video, is that correct? Yes. And in your opinion, was that video capable of making an accurate recording? Yes. The things that, were, that you were told match what you see on the video? Yes. It matches the evidence that was collected? Yes. Just my personal witness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to show you what we've marked as stage 42 uh, flash drive in. On that flash drive is the video we've been describing. Okay. Yes, sir. And it's a fair and accurate copy of that video, is that correct? Yes, I believe so. We're offering stage 42. It's no objection. All right. Stage 42 is admitted. Is What file? Is it just one file on there? A couple of files? Is it a? It's a viewer with with a, a video file. Okay. But you have to have the viewer to see the file. Okay. All right. Permission to publish? You may. Can you tell us what we're looking at here? Uh, that's going to be the hallway uh, where the classroom for Ms. Altman is at and the hallway where the shooting took place at. And for the jury's benefit, they have seen steals from this video. The classroom is literally right here in this corner. Yes, sir. And if the stairwell, there's one stairwell where I'm pointing right here. Yes. Is there another stairwell further down? Yes. Okay. And there's uh, been testimony that this is kind of like a, an H with two crossbars. There's another hallway going further down this way. Is that correct? Yes. You just can't see it in this video. That's correct. Okay. Do you recall who this person is I'm pointing at here? Yes. Who is that? I believe that is Charlie. Last name of Johnson? Yes. She was a student there at the time. Yes. I'm stopping at 9.12 a.m. Who do we see just walk through? Uh, that is Zacchaeus Selby.
Detective, what would you say? Uh, you just observed that several people ran out of the classroom after shots were being fired inside the classroom. Uh, you also saw Zakia Selby running out of the classroom and falling to the ground. <coughs> and then you see Timothy Simpkins falling and shooting him with a gun. I'll back this up just a little bit and ask you a couple of questions, okay? All right. We've already seen a steal uh, from this uh, video, but this is Ms. Hoffman. It's coming out. Yes. This is going to be Ms. McNeely. Yes. This is Coach Boyd. Yes. Okay. Now, there is a glass case right there. Is that correct? Yes. Charlie Johnson's running this way, and it appears there's three other students who are running that way as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. This girl, I'm pointing at near that glass case, she makes a right hand turn. Yes. The other girl's a little further to the left, and Charlie Johnson is still running down the hallway. Yes. Zach is just falling down on the ground. Yes. Coach Boyd's almost completely caught up with Miss McNeely. Yes. If we look at that glass case, do you see where that dot just appeared? Yes. This girl just turned to her right. Yes. <clears throat> this class case was just shattered. Yes. That girl turns left and that's her right. What happens to her? To reading. I can rephrase. Please. Do you have an opinion as to what happens to that girl if she turns to her left and not to her right? I'm going to get the speculation. So cool. Yes, I do. Uh, I believe that she would have been in danger of being shot also. Right here, does it appear that Zach is trying to attempt to stand up? Yes. Very bottom corner here, does it appear that you see the, the barrel of a gun? Yes. Do you see anything coming out of the barrel of that gun? I see a flash coming out of the barrel. What does that indicate to you? That a bullet has been fired. Yes. Very far background here. Miss McNeely and Coach Boyd. Yes. What do you see on the ceiling right here? Uh, that's going to be smoke. From what? That's going to be from the discharge of, of, of a gun with a bullet. Detective for 30, police officer for 32 years, you had the occasion to fire guns inside. Yes. When you fire a gun inside a closed area, does the smoke from firing that gun tend to accumulate? Yes, it does. The more times you fire a gun, the more smoke tends to accumulate. Yes. <clears throat> oh, by the way, the position that Zach is in right here, would you call that an aggressive position? No, we're not.
any position that we see him as he exits that door, would you call that an aggressive position? No. Do you see more smoke begin to accumulate to ceiling it to this hallway? Yes, I do. What would that indicate to you? That more rounds have been fired. Where is Zach at now? Uh, he is at the entrance to that first stairwell. Standing up? He's laying down on the floor. Face down or on his back? He appears to be on his back. Head up? Yes. Doing what? Uh, appears like he's trying to get away. Look at the person who's shooting him. Yes. Does it appear that he's crawling? Yes. What does it appear the defendant's doing? At that point, he's, he appears to still be pointing the gun at Zach. Kind of a classical shooting position. Feet wide apart, raise the gun up right in the middle, take aim, pull the trigger. Yes. Right here in the hallway, you see that, what you see, marks are colored? Yeah, it appears to be red blood. defendant turns around, he places the gun back into his waistband, and then he starts walking down that hallway. As he steps out of the shoe, he moves the shoe behind too. Yes, he does. Judge, may I just for a moment? May. Yes. Um, did you have an occasion to go see Zach when he was at the hospital? Yes, I did. And did he have gunshot wounds to his chest, arms, and legs? Yes. Do you know if he had that surgery? Yes, he did. And you, and do you know if Calvin Pettit was there? Yes, he was. Did he have gunshot wounds? Yes, he did. Where were they? Uh, he had a grazed wound to his left arm and then a wound towards his back. In your opinion, did it appear to you that Zach was in serious condition? Yes. You've been a detective, you know, police officer for 32 years. You've seen people shot. Uh, based on your experience and training, did it, it appear to be critical? Yes. And what about Mr. Pettit? Uh, I believe Mr. Pettit was also critical. And Ms. McNeely, you know she was injured. Yes, she was. And how was she injured? Uh, she had a grazed wound from one of the bullets. Do you know where on her body that grazed wound was? I believe it was along her left hip. Her left hip? Yes. In this location, where this high school is, and this shooting occurred, that's in Tarrant County, Texas. Yes. And that was on October 6th, uh, 2021. Yes. Judge, I pass the witness. Cross examination. Yes. So you're the lead detective uh, that compiled everything for this case? Yes, ma'am. And you also had Detective Hall, Van Trick, King, Schaefer, and Simmons, correct? Yes. And each detective had certain things that they were going to do. Yes. So you say you're in a violent crime unit? Yes. Okay. And you've been in that unit for how long? Uh, it was originally called the robbery unit and eventually became a violent crimes unit, but I've been out there since 2010. And so you handle violent objects? So yes. Right. Yes, ma'am. You've had a chance uh, to review the fight that occurred in room 2026, did you not? Yes. 
Would you consider that a violent fight? I believe it's a violent fight. Initiated by whom? Uh, Mr. Silver. Judge as defense exhibit number three and actually if you recognize that. Yes. And we've seen the this compilation. Is this a, a fair and accurate depiction of the person that was standing outside of the room with Zakia Shelby on or about October the 6th, 2021? Yes. Okay. Yes. Initially walked into the uh, walked into the school. Zach appeared to be pacing down the hall, correct? Yes. He didn't immediately enter into uh, Miss Hawkins' class, did he? No. And then at some point, Zach gave Charlie his phone. Uh, I'm not sure if he gave her his phone or not. From the film, you can see her with the phone, correct? You can't see her with the phone. And at some point, it appears she's laughing. Yes. As if she was anticipating something was going to happen. Yes. So when Zach comes in, he puts his uh, backpack outside the classroom, does he not? Yes. And at some point, he has to come back in and get his backpack. Yes, ma'am. Right? And shortly thereafter, so Zach Tim was in the classroom at eight fifty nine. You did a timeline, did you not? Yes. Do you have the timeline with you? So yeah, I can find it real quick. Yes. So Tim was in the classroom at 85932, correct? Yes. And Zach comes in at, he's in the hallway with Charlie at 911 and 27 seconds. Yes. Correct? And then he's in the hallway by himself at 9109 in the hallway, correct? Yes. He enters the room at 914. Yes, ma'am. And you hear a shot at 9, 15, and 4 seconds. Yes. So Zach immediately went to Tim, correct? I believe he did. Well, how many times have, would you say you watched that video? Uh, the school video or the? Classroom video. The classroom video, the second. I uh, watched it several times. I'm not sure how many I've watched it. Did you watch it just before coming? Uh, here today? Yes, I did.
What did he publish it? For our video in Typically, that's kind of like a gang reference. So, on blood means it relates to what gang? To the blood street gang. And that's a basically a term that's saying I pledge my allegiance on blood, correct? That I'm not, not sure about. But on blood, nigga, on blood is what he said, correct? That's what it sounded like, yes. At any time during your investigation, did you get with Mansfield uh, we phrase, from your training and experience in the violent crime unit, you're aware that he got Tim got his head stomped. Yes. Times. Yes. Is that action by someone capable of causing death or serious bodily injury? In this circumstance, I don't think that's the case. Is it possible? Is it possible? Yes, ma'am. Did Ms. Herrera and, and, and Coach Boyd tell you they feared the Templar? Objection, hearsay. Let's stand. Several teachers. Yes, ma'am. You interviewed several students. Yes, ma'am. Without seeing what they said, some concerns were raised. Objection. It's our st statement and answer requires him to basically do like hearsay. It's vague. We we'll draw, we'll draw the question. Okay. <clears throat> From viewing the tape, the video, the fight. Would you agree that the fight looked one-sided? Yes, it appeared that way. And it appeared that at one point, Tim was in a fetal position. Yes. Is that a position of surrender? Yes. And in that position of surrender, you're, he's still getting hit about the head and stomped by... Yes. Yes, ma'am. Anything particular that you notice about the clothing uh, that were worn Thank you. 
begin to uh, look uh, at the photo to see that Tim had some bruising uh, about his head. Yes. Uh, if you know, uh, was he provided any medical attention once he turned himself in? That I don't know. You were notified that he was turning himself in, correct? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall who notified you? Uh, I believe it was one of my sergeants that called me about it. And do you recall what time uh, he turned himself in? Uh, no, I don't. It's like one thirty ish sound familiar? Yeah, it's within probably three hours or so of the offense occurring. That sounds about right. So this happens at nine, three hours later, he's turning into it. Yes. <clears throat> within those few seconds of Zach entering into the classroom and violently beating Tim. We don't know what effect getting stomped in the head had on his brain or anything. Else. No, I don't know anything about that, man. Within the video that we are seeing, the fight video that we're seeing right now, who provided that to you? Uh, that was, uh, I believe, that was forwarded by one of my sergeants. But that particular morning when this went down, kids were, it's like airdrop. This went like viral. And what does it mean when you say airdrop? Oh, it means that it was sent out to many, many recipients who were able to view the video. So there could have been a, a longer extended, did you ask for a longer extended video from people that had made? Yeah, we looked for a longer extended videos, but every, all the videos we received were that exact way. He's trying to maintain control of the gun that was in his waistband. And he's huddled over, holding on to like a stomach area. Yes. Where he's get, where he put the gun in his left. All right. Yes. This counsel asks you what effect being hit or stomped would have on this defendant's brain. Recall that question. Yes. He brought this gun to school long before he ever got hit in the head. Yes. Pass this witness. All right, mini redirect. I mean, recross, excuse me. Yes, ma'am.
Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen, Drew, with that, the state will rest his case in chief. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, at this point, it would be a good time for us to take our lunch break. My anticipation is to begin um, at 1 o'clock um, to go from there. All rise for the jury. Images. testify in this case pertaining to him um, and so we would ask the court sorry, we are asking the court to hold him in contempt of uh, violating the rule as instructed to him when he was here just last Thursday um, one of the videos was posted as he left the courtroom on last Thursday a video that was from the news media of him leaving the courtroom I have all of the videos that we are uh, speaking of on my phone, which I think I left somewhere in the back, but I can show that to the court if the court would like. Uh, let me clarify just a little bit. Sure. Starting from the beginning, Mr. Selby um, was sworn in as a witness on Thursday? Yes, he was. Okay. And he posted something on his Instagram concerning the trial um, as he left? Um, there was a video from the news media showing him exiting the courtroom. Um, and that was the video that he posted on his Instagram with laughing faces and fire. Um, with okay. some. <clears throat> laughing faces and fire, okay. Um, and it does have a song playing in the background. Um, I don't know the exact lyrics to it, but the court can be able to hear that. Um, following. Hold on, so then. What happened next? And following that, there were a number of videos just posted of him fighting, which we believe is obviously an essential part of this case, um, since the defense is alleging um, he was the first aggressor. Okay, where were these 
videos of Selby fighting posted? On his Instagram story. He posted pictures of himself fighting on his Instagram story? Yes. Okay. Um, Now, are these videos of himself fighting any of these witnesses, um, any friends or relatives of the defendant, anything like that? We do not know personally who the individuals are. Okay, then what happened? That continued through the weekend, okay. videos of him fighting. And then on Monday, he posted a video of Tim sitting here in his chair and a number of other messages such as, um, let me get my popcorn out to watch this shit. Damn, they're hoeing me. Um, there's another one. Again, my phone is it's fine. back here. Um, is this video of Tim sitting in his chair something that was shot from the audience or, or something taken from a newsreel? From the newsreel. From the newsreel. Okay, and what else? Also yesterday, a witness that was here and sworn for the state and sitting in the back received a Instagram message in the form of a, what's called a vanishing message, meaning once you see it, it disappears. Sure. From Zach that says, what are you doing? And she perceived that to be a threat. Okay, and this is the Charlotte Johnson individual? Yes, and she will also be here at noon if the court so needs her. Okay, and what else happened? That's all that we have okay. so far. With regards to the first four items, while not ideal, what is, um, if you were here for my admonishments, Mr. Selby, what court order did he violate for me to um, hold him in contempt concerning one through four? I'll get to five. Um, well, we believe that as a witness, he is out watching media coverage regarding this case. Um, which you should not be doing as a sworn witness in the case. Okay. Maybe I should have admonished him concerning that. I did admonish him not to speak to other witnesses or to, um, uh, mostly just a normal admonishment not to speak to witnesses in the case. Um, so I'll have to consider that. State, do you have any response or request concerning any of those items? Absolutely. I don't think the remedy set out by the <clears throat> rules of evidence for the code of criminal procedure is contempt. I think the remedy is exclusion. And so we have no objection to that. Exclude his testimony. Keep him from being called as a witness. That's the entire basis of the rule, is you don't have comparative testimony. You have what he really has to say. And if that's their concern, apparently, then exclude him. We agree. What about five? What about the issue of him um, potentially tampering with a, a witness. Did you have any more information with regards to that? Or? I don't have any more information other than what's been said. Okay. I don't, I'm, and? I'm not of the opinion that that alone by itself is going to be tampering with a witness. Did you, you certainly, I understand what their, their position is going to be, but again, the remedy is exclusion. I understand. Did, uh, was, did Charlie Johnson make any statement to you that this made, is this a she? It is. That she, this made her feel threatened? No, Judge. Not to y'all? Okay. Not to oh. them directly, but to the investigator. The investigator. Okay. Or whoever's, maybe victims, whoever's with them during the day, to which she was told to just block him and mm -hmm. something along those lines. Okay. All right. Well, um, and what? Who asked Mr. Selby to be here at noon? We asked the state to ask him to be here. Okay. All right. Well, then I will handle that at noon. Um, I'll consider the, the remedy that to be, to be handled. <clears throat> Judge, if defense counsel intends to call him as a witness, um, he may need an attorney, certainly based on the, the very allegations they brought for you. Well, yeah, anybody even just being asked to be um, held in contempt may uh, need to have an attorney. I will um, I'll consider appointing an attorney when he gets here at, at 12. Is there anything further with regards to that item? 
No. Okay. Thank you for bringing it to my attention. Um, all right. Anything further? No, that's fair. That's No. Okay, I'm hearing y'all's motion outside the presence at 1245, and I will, I guess, speak to Mr. Selby at you. Um, That, that'll be all right now. Mr. Walter, I'd like to ask you something real quick, and you can be here if you want. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't have to do with these motions or this issue. <coughs> in fact, let's just talk in general. Yes, sir. Yep.
We're back on the record. One seven seven three nine five zero, State of Texas versus Timothy Simpkin. The state having rested, does the defense wish to be heard outside the presence of the jury? Uh, yes, Your Honor. The defense would like to make its motion for a directed verdict. Um, the state has failed to prove each and every element of the offense of attempted capital murder um, beyond a reasonable doubt. Specifically, the state has failed to prove that Mr. Simpkins had the specific intent to cause the death, and that is, uh, in order for it to be a capital murder, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the result and not just conduct that could lead to result. They have to prove that he had the specific intent to, uh, for the result itself to occur, and they have failed to do that. I would also, excuse me, I'm still catching my breath. Yeah. <laughs> um, point your attention to paragraph two of the indictment where the state, and if you will, um, follow along with me in the statute of 1903 and 1902. Where are you starting? I'm going to start with 1903A, which is the first essential element for a capital to murder is that a person com commits an offense if the person commits murder as defined under 1902b1 which 1902b1 specifically defines the murder to be intentionally which uh, or knowingly caused the death of an individual so they have to allege that he had the specific intent to cause the result what they have alleged here is that he's had an intent to commit an act that could cause the result, which is under 1902b2. But capital murder requires that to be proved under 1902b1. And so if paragraph 2 is not, if the, uh, the court does not have a charge to which they can give to the jury, 
as it pertains to paragraph two because the state has failed to actually allege an attempted capital in paragraph two. And courts of appeals, let me bring this up so I can see. Gray v. State 152, Southwest 3D 125. Our legislature has made clear that a trial judge's charge to the jury must set forth the law applicable to the case, which paragraph 2 does not set forth the law that would be applicable to an attempt to capital murder. It further says it is not enough for the charge to merely incorporate the allegation in the charging instrument. Instead, it must also apply the law to the facts adduced at trial. This is because the jury must be instructed under what circumstance they should convict or under what circumstance they should acquit. Jury charges which fail to apply the law to the facts adduced at trial are erroneous. And so without the state having actually alleged an attempted capital murder in paragraph two because they have not alleged a specific intent to commit the result and not an intent to commit an act that could lead to the result. There's a difference there. Um, and I believe the law is clear because they specifically spell out 1902B1, which is different from 1902B2. So we would ask the, the court to direct its verdict as it pertains to this case and specifically as it pertains to paragraph two. And with regards to paragraph two, are you saying that it's insufficient in its charge because it should read attempt to intentionally cause the death of more than one person? It should read um, intentionally attempt to cause the death of a person, whoever that person is, and you'll go on over to number seven, the person then murders more than one person. Now that part could be under B2, which they've put in here, during the same criminal transaction, but it's a two part. It's 1903 A, they're attempting to allege A and seven, A7. But they have failed to do so by not alleging A. Let me hear from the state on the argument concerning paragraph two. Judge, in reference to the argument on paragraph two, this particular prose has already been held to be sufficient for purposes of capital murder and killing more than one person numerous times. It, to address her particular argument, it's not alleged to commit that clear, clear damage to human life with intent to cause serious bodily injury. It's clearly alleged is attempt to cause the death by intentionally shooting somebody. That's an intentional act. The language is there. It's her disagreement may be grammar, but this has been held to be sufficient. This alleges an intentional act, it requires an intentional act with intent to cause the death. Now the difference is it's an attempted crime, so we have to have that language in there for attempt. It's not a completed crime. I hear you. All right. And your argument, um, Ms. Clayton, with regards to paragraph one, is that it hasn't been proven all the elements beyond reasonable doubt? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Did you have an element to which you believe they are missing? I would say specifically to the element of intentionally, let me read it correctly, to any person with the intent to place the public or a substantial group of the public in fear, and that they haven't proved beyond a reasonable doubt that it was Mr. Simpkins' intent to do so. All right. The court will overrule um, both motions in the case. Uh, is there anything further uh, you wish urged outside the presence of the jury? No, Your Honor. Okay, both sides ready for the well, hold on. Let me see. Uh, are y'all going to open? No, Your Honor. Defense waives opening. Okay. And we'll get into testimony. Okay, y'all plan to, to open a case? Yes. Okay. Are y'all ready for the jury? Yes. Okay. Judge, I just, we obviously don't know who they're going to call. Right. But there's a motion limiting effect as to any extraneous act on the part oh. of mm -hmm. uh, the witness that you just admonished. And I don't know what their intentions are, but based on previous conversations or previous motions in front of you, if they intend to get into it, I'm assuming we 
hear it now as a versus us having to stand and object over the year. I understand. Uh, it would be my preference at this point that if um, your intention is to um, go into subjects we discussed with regards to the state's motion and limiting um, and the, the elicit of extraneous offenses in, oh, I'm sorry, with regards to the state's motion and limiting, um, that we hear it outside the presence of the jury before we bring them in. If that's not where y'all are going, then let's get started. Yes, I did actually min min to mention that some of the witnesses that we have brought here today, we do anticipate that their testimony would be about the uh, given an opinion of the reputation mm -hmm. of uh, Zakaia Silby. Okay. And that reputation being uh, violent and aggressive, which case law has uh, stated that we can get into those uh, type of reputation and character trait, pertinent character traits, when uh, there's evidence shown, which it has been shown, that this particular uh, Zakaia Silby was an initial aggressor. Okay, and just with regards to that, the case law that I've been reading and the information on it seems to indicate that, are you talking about this being like a communicated character attack where the defendant knew about this reputation or that this goes to um, the act of the first aggression by the victim? Which one? Or both? Uh, we are using it to go towards the act of first aggression by the victim as well as to establish the reasonableness of the fear um, with, from Mr. Simpkins. And the case that we quoted the last time says that he need not know the specific acts himself, mm -hmm. um, but that they... Right, if you're using it to show the reasonableness of the defendant's fear, then you would need to prove that that item was something he knew. Um, with regards to it um, going towards the uh, victim's character for violence in that he was the first aggressor, um, I understand that. Um, those case laws seem to speak a little bit to the idea that there is some um, ambiguity in a defendant's um, actions, and so therefore that that can be used to show what the victim's intent was, that he meant to be the first aggressor. What, what do you think that it would show the, Mr. Selby's reputation for violence would go to show, uh, what do you think it would um, clarify in the defendant's actions in this case? I mean, in the victim's actions in yeah. this case, Mr. Selby's, excuse me. Um, to be quite frank, um, I mean, I think the testimony is just uncomfortable controverted that he was the first aggressor mm -hmm. um, and so for us it we would tend to use it more so for the reasonableness of his fear okay um, is that uh, your your first witness this is um, will also include this this idea no the first witness was uh, will be Charlie Johnson okay Charlie Johnson and then when would we get to those witnesses in Continue. Right after her. Right after her. Do you want to take that now or hear Charlie and then take that up? Okay, give me one second. Sure. And who would that be? Stephanie Beatry. Okay, Stephanie Beatry. That's not Charlie Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. And then what I'd like to do is is vet out your your issues outside the presence so we can get a good ruling. Okay, perfect.
Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give and the cause on the trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Yes. Okay. Have a seat here. Okay. Make sure that microphone fits <clears throat> you appropriately. I'll ask that you just make sure you listen to the entirety of, a, um, of an attorney's question before answering so you don't talk over them, okay? You have to answer out loud? Yes. Okay. And then answer loudly like you just did so that everybody in the back can hear you, okay? Yes. All right. I'll ask that you uh, establish who the witness is and then proceed to the um, objected to portion. Okay. Is that uh, fair? Just for me to put on the record who this is or your question? Yeah. Let, let her introduce herself, lay the predicate for who she is, how she might know the information we want, but she doesn't. And then mm -hmm. uh, the portion that you'd like to admit that you know the state is objecting to. Okay. Thank you. Will you please state your name for the record? Stephanie Viteri. And what do you do for me? I'm an assistant principal at James Cubbon Middle School. Okay. And how long have you been an assistant principal? At James Cubbon Middle School or? Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. Ten years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so were you the assistant principal for one named Zacchaeus Selby? Yes. And do you recall that particular student being one of under your authority? Yes. Um, have you had it? Do you know Zacchaeus? Or let me refer that. Had you come to know Zacchaeus well enough in, to form a opinion about his reputation? Yes. And what would that opinion be? Based on my recollection and the referrals that I've received from his teachers, it was about fighting, profanity, and um, altercations within the classroom. Okay. And what grades would, you, would he have been in when you were his assistant principal? Seventh and eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the extent. Okay, and that's the um, proposed testimony which to elicit yes. concerning that issue. All right, state any objections to the um, testimony? Yes, sir. Okay. What are your objections? Do you want the witness staying here or do you want me to? Do you have some reasons yeah. this should? Yeah. Okay. Well, one object is impermissible under 404 okay. and 403. Okay. First of all, we'll just start off at the time. This is <coughs> the, her opinion is when he was in seventh and eighth grade, okay. which I will presume is the ages 13 and 14, maybe 12 and 13. Mm -hmm. So some three or four, some two or three years before this crime occurred. Okay. So, you get past relevance. And then, Judge, in looking at the very case that's been incited to you towards the state, there must be some specific act that is probative of the, they say deceased, I'm going to say the victim's state of mind or intent. The witness must, must know, the defendant did not know what the act. they got to point to some specific act that they're trying to explain. And as the court has heard the testimony, I certainly agree with the defense counsel, it's the unequivocal, the fight had ended, has stopped. Without question, even on cross-examination, the witness has said that Selby raised his hands up and said, I'm done. And it's only after that point that this defendant threw his gun and began shooting. And Judge, I'd also point this out to the court. Additional case law for you. This defendant's not entitled to self defense. We're looking at the case law I handed to you, the Wilcox v. State, which, while it's an unpublished opinion from February of this year, it cites numerous published opinions, it clearly states that when the defendant becomes the aggressor and continues to shoot, he's no longer acting in self defense. He's the aggressor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so, at some point, he's not acting in self-defense. Okay. He has no right to continue shooting. So if that's true, if he has no right to self-defense, then this evidence is not admissible. And that's consistent with a lot of, of, of uh, case law in Torres v. State. Okay. Uh, can I clarify something really fast that um, the state's attorney has uh, just stated incorrectly that the defense 
agrees that it's uncontroverted that the fight ended and stopped. That was not my statement. That's and that's not the state the defense's position. I am. All right. This time, um, I'm going to find that this will be admissible evidence. I believe that it would be um, for a use other than conformity under 404B, that it is more uh, probative than prejudicial, or substantially more probative than prejudicial under 403, and that although the 7th and 8th grade issue does um, um, detract from the relevance, I believe that's something that could be addressed and handled um, via weight and from cross-examination and from admissibility. So as far as that um, um, testimony goes, I'll, I'll allow it this time. And Judge, yes. certainly based on this ruling and their intended line of questioning of evidence, mm -hmm. it is certainly our intent that they've opened the door to all the extraneous acts that we've given notice of, in particular that this defendant was involved in a shooting one week prior to well, this occurred and all the text messages back and forth between him and his friends where he said he's going to shoot first and not involve himself in a fight. Sure, I understand. And the admissibility of other acts based on or other things based on what the defense's theory is, is um, will be left to when, when and if the state requests to introduce that testimony. I'll have to make that ruling at that time. This time i got to make this ruling here. So I understand. <laughs> uh, all right. Anything further about that particular testimony? No, not from the defense. Nope. Both sides ready for the jury? Say true. Uh, well, you have to join the jury. Do you have anything to address the court before the jury comes in? Possibly. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. She does not have to sit there though, well, because she's also still not going to be a first witness. She will not be a first witness. No. Okay. Well, then please um, return to wherever you were waiting. And I uh, just remember you've been, just real quick, you've been sworn in under the rules, so that means uh, you can't attend testimony. Please don't talk, talk to other witnesses or potential witnesses. I don't want them influencing you and you influencing them. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh -huh. Interesting. All right. Let me call your next witness. Janelle Turner. Tanner. Say that again. Janelle Tanner. Okay. And is, will this evidence be outside the presence of the jury? Yes. Outside the presence, pretty much laying the same type of, okay. and for the court to decide if it's evidence. Okay. And Judge, yes. one final objection in reference to that last witness. Okay. The rules of evidence clearly state that a person can give their opinion as to reputation without you cannot give the basis of that unless it's specifically asked. The basis that she gave, the specific instance that she gave was all hearsay. It's nothing based on personal knowledge. She never witnessed it herself. So we will object to her getting into anything specific because she has no personal knowledge of those things. She did not witness those things. If you're going to allow her to give your reputation, if I explore the basis of that, I understand. But if I don't, all they can do is simply ask, are you aware of this person's reputation within the community? I understand the state's requested limitation. I don't disagree with it, um, especially That's considering her underlying basis is hearsay, right? So she can say that she's a school teacher or a principal, that she is aware of his reputation and then what that is, going into like what she mentioned about how she other teachers that. telling, yes, exactly. I will instruct her to limit that. That was not my intention to use that testimony. We are sticking to the reputation. Uh, I understand, sure. And you can probably get that by structuring your question a certain way as well. All right, I understand. Thank you. Uh, bring up Ms. Tanner. <clears throat> Ms. 
Okay, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony which you're about to give in the cause now on trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Oh, you can have a seat here. I'm going to ask that you just make sure that you listen to the entirety of any uh, question from either attorney. Uh, make sure they're done asking their entire question before you try to answer. And then when you answer, talk all the way to the back, okay? Okay. Okay. But you got to talk louder. I'll say it now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. There you go. All right. Your witness, please. Thank you. Can you please state your name for the record? Janelle Tanner. And what do you do for a living? I am an assistant principal at Timberview High School. And how long have you been employed as an assistant principal at Timberview High School? I started October of 2019. So I've completed four years. I'm starting my fifth year. Okay. Um, do you know of Zacchaeus Selby? Yes. How do you know Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus is, um, during that time, he was on Timberview's campus. I was his assistant principal because of our alphas are split up. And so he has the end of the alphabet, and that's the, um, the group of kids that I served over. Okay. And do you recall what grades Zacchaeus would have been in when you were his assistant principal? Uh, starting out as a freshman and then uh, at the beginning of his sophomore year. Um, have you been able to form an opinion as to Zacchaeus's reputation? Um, based on some of the referrals uh, that were submitted by teachers, uh, yes. Okay. And what would that reputation be? Um, based on the infractions that were submitted by teachers, um, he had infractions of skipping, um, he had an infraction of fighting, um, and there was an infraction where he was uh, disrespectful to a teacher. referrals that were submitted by teachers. What referrals did this defendant have? Uh, Timothy. Yes, um, He's had referrals for skipping, and then there was um, one referral for um, inappropriate behavior. How about for a referral for bringing a gun to school? Um, if there is, it wasn't processed by me. What was the inappropriate behavior? It was a um, classroom, maybe about his freshman year or sophomore year, I can't recall, um, where he went to the restroom for a long period of time and a teacher asked him about um, why was he in the restroom so long and I can't recall the statement verbatim about, he used the word uh, ass. Um, that's a, about as much as I can remember about that particular referral. So just using inappropriate comments in class, uh, not towards the teacher, but just, just used from the class. You have no personal knowledge of anything in reference to either this defendant or Mr. Selby? I'm not you did, sure. You didn't witness anything yourself? I did not witness. So you're basing your opinion simply on what you have read or someone told you? Simply what I've read. 
you've never actually spoken to anybody about his reputation? Just based off of the referrals, I would. So you're based. You have an opinion. You don't have. You don't know what his reputation is. Again, it's based off of the referrals that I've read. So do you? Are, is your personal opinion is that he's not a law-abiding student, or are you just want to say that he has some referrals? My statement is that he has referrals. Okay. So you don't really know what his reputation is. You've never spoken to anybody. You can go to the teacher's lounge and go, man, that Mr. Selway, he's whatever, and they, they tell you that they agree that his reputation among all the other teachers or students is that's bad. You don't have anything like that. If I had questions about referrals, then I would refer to the teacher to get more information, but I don't recall if at any time where a referral that I process, if I followed up with question with teachers. Okay, so you don't have... You don't not aware of what his reputation is. I'm gonna help you out. There's two things. There's reputation and there's opinion. Okay. People can have a reputation within their community. And they know that reputation if you talk to other people about that reputation. Okay, have you spoken to anybody about Selby's reputation? Not specific acts, but what his reputation is. We have if I had questions about any of the infractions or actions, I would get consult from other assistant principals. So you said, yeah, did you? Not that I can recall. Okay, so you can't recall ever speaking to any teachers or assistant principals about his reputation? About specific situations. I talked to teachers if I had questions about uh, situations. Do you have an opinion as to what you believe his character trait is for being peaceful students? It's based on the referrals that were, if, if I'm looking at the referrals, he's a skipper. He's been disrespectful to a teacher. That's it? That's, so do you have an opinion? And he fought, he, he had a fight. Do you know anything about the fight? Any details? Any details about the fight? Mm -hmm. it, that I can recall it happened in the restroom. Okay. You don't know anything else about it? Um, and the student he had the fight with. Okay. Do you have an opinion as to his character trait for being peaceful and well <coughs> student? Again, based on the referral season. You gotta ask that question yes or no. <coughs> Repeat the question for me. Do you have an opinion to Mr. Selby's character trait for being peaceful and well minded? You don't, that's yeah. fine. You're shaking your head no. I don't. Okay. Well, Judge, I object to the role of this testimony. Um, all right. Vince, right. do you have any other questions for this witness? No, Your Honor, I do not. You do not? Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Anyway, you're calling this one now? Or yeah. All right, Ms. Terry, you can step down. Oh, let me tell you this also. Uh, you've been sworn in, so don't go anywhere just yet. <laughs> um, make sure you don't talk to other witnesses about this case and don't let them talk about this case around you. I don't want you influenced by them or them, them influenced by you, okay? Okay. All right, thank you. All right. seem like she was testifying as to a reputation of her own opinion so much as she was just regurgitating um, based on some referrals she had received. So unless that, I mean, based on that testimony right there, she would not be able to testify. I don't think she would have the predicate to testify to an opinion or reputation of Mr. Selby. So, uh, do you have another witness that we need to 
discuss this issue with? No. Okay. Ready for the okay. Do you know <laughs> what witness you're going to call first? Charlie Johnson. Okay. Let's go ahead and get Charlie up here, and then we'll then we'll call the jury. <clears throat> Judge, in reference to the first witness, I would renew the same objections that maybe failed to lay the predicate that she actually has an opinion or is a great reputation. I'd like to hear her um, answers to defend outside the presence of the jury again concerning whether she had an opinion or a reputation. Which witness? So the very first one. Oh, okay. Um, I think the question of do you have an opinion or do you know the reputation concerning violent character? I think be very specific and then we can see if they have one. Okay, thank you. Are you Ms. Johnson? Hold on. Why don't you stand up real quick and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give and the cause now in trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? All right. Have a seat here. Let me tell you a couple of things. One, I want you to make sure that you listen entirely to the questions that are asked. Make sure the attorneys are done asking the entire question before you answer. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. And then two, what I need to do is when you talk, uh, I need to talk all the way to the back. I know you have a microphone, but unless you talk loud, we can't understand you. Can you tell my bailiff in the back that you understand? I understand. Okay. All right. And then, uh, all right. Both sides ready for the jury? Defense ready. Defense ready. All right. Bring it. <coughs> I'm going to see it. Oh, okay. 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 Please call your first witness. Defense calls Charlie Johnson. And then just so that we're in front of the jury, do you wish to make any opening statements? No, Your Honor. Defense will waive opening. Okay. Right. Ms. Johnson, I'll remind you that you've been sworn to tell the truth in this case, okay? So you got to answer out loud. Yes. All right. Your witness. Good afternoon, Charlie. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. So throughout this process, I need you to keep your voice up, okay? Okay. How old are you? 18. So what high school did you go to? Timberview High School. Did you graduate from Timberview? No, ma'am. What did you do instead? I got my GED. Do you currently have a job? Yes, ma'am. Where do you work? I work as a nanny for my cousin and at Rosa's. What is Rosa's? The restaurant? Yes, ma'am. Do you recall the events that happened on October 6th of 2021? Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us what happened that day? Um, I was going to Coach Boyd's class and I was a little late and I seen the case in the hallway and he asked me, he stopped me and asked me to record a video for him, a video of him fighting and I was like, okay. So let me stop you right there, Charlie. So. Kind of how it works, I understand you're nervous, is that I'll ask you questions, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just have to answer just briefly, okay? Okay. So you're in the hallway and you're headed to Coach Boy's class, is that right? Yes, ma'am. 
What subject does Coach Boy teach? Uh, that was my credit recovery class. And about what time of day is this? Mm, around 9 o'clock. Were you the only person in the hallway? Yes, ma'am. When did you see Zacchaeus in the hallway? When I was turning that hallway to go to what, uh, in the English hall, turning the English hall. What was his demeanor like in the hallway? He was, he seemed frustrated. He was pacing back and forth. So when you went up to him, um, what happened? He was just like, hey, can you record this video for me? What did you say? I was like, okay. Did you record on his phone or your phone? Mine. So after you made the agreement, what happened after that? Um, I was standing kind of by the men's restroom, and he was walk he was standing at the door. He knocked on the door, and that's when the teacher let him in. Who came out once he knocked on the door? Miss Altman. What happened after she opened the door? Um, his backpack was see he had set his backpack down at the door, and she had told him to grab his backpack, and he just like he looked at her and was like he just picked the backpack up. And then he set the backpack down on the front two desks. After he set the backpack down, what happened? He just walked to the back of the classroom, and that's when the fight started happening. When you say the fight, uh, what happened with that fight? Zach hit, was hitting Tim. Were you recording this when it happened? Yes, ma'am. Who was with you during this time frame? Um, I was by myself, but there was other students standing at the door. About how many people were at the door with you? Two. Did you, re did you record the entire fight? Yes. What made you stop? Um, I stopped when Decay started stomping on his head. Why did you stop recording at that moment? Because it just got too serious. Was the classroom loud or quiet during this fight? Um, it was quiet for the most part. You could just hear like the bookshelves and stuff and him getting thrown across the classroom. <clears throat> Did any of the other teachers come in to stop the fight? Yes. Do you recall who those people were? First, Ms. Herrera walked in and then it was Coach Boyd. Were you still recording at this point? Um, I stopped whenever Miss Herrera came. What did you do after Miss Herrera came? I just was standing at the door, and that's whenever the case was stomping on his head. When did you decide to leave Miss Altman's doorway? Um, when I heard the gunshots, I started running a little. Did you hear anything prior to the actual gunshots? Um, no, I heard, I heard Coach Boyd yell that there was a gun, but I didn't really like register it in my head. And while you were running, um, this sounds like a silly question, but were you shot while you were running? No, ma'am. Okay. What happened while you were running? Um, I felt the bullet go past me, and then that's when the trophy case broke and then that's when I turned the hallway. And when you turned in the hallway, what did you do next? I went to the, I went downstairs and I went to the um, officer's room. Did you call anyone after this happened? My mom. Did you talk to the police after this happened? Yes, I talked to one officer. And when you talked to the police, did you tell them that you recorded the fight? Mm, I don't think so. Did they ask you? No, ma'am. Okay. Has anyone else asked you about your recording of the fight? No, ma'am. And you came to court today, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And did you bring a copy of that? Yes, ma'am. Why are you just now bringing a copy of this? Because I just found it. Okay, so how is that? Explain how you just found Because it was on my other phone, because I had a new phone. It was on my other one, so it was my other phone was broken, so I didn't think it was going to work. But when I found it, it happened to turn on. May I approach you? 
Okay, Charlie. So I am showing you was in pre-marked as defendant's exhibit number four. Can you tell me what this is? The flash drive. Okay, so what is on this flash drive? The video of the fight. Okay, and is it, have you seen this flash drive? Yes, ma'am. Okay, did you give it to uh, Ms. Clayton and I prior to the trial today? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and has it been altered in any way since you took it off of your phone and gave it to us? No, ma'am. Okay, and was it time marked on your iPhone as this is the day that it happened? Oh, no. Okay, so how do you know that's in fact the same video? I got it from, because it was in my, I recorded it on my Snapchat. So it was in my Snapchat. Okay, and how, can you tell us how that saves? I just saved it. You know, I just went and saved it online. Saved it to my camera roll. Okay. And did you initial this flash drive here? Yes, ma'am. Is that your handwriting that is, is a C and a J? Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Defense offers. <coughs> All right. Once, uh, I think we're going to need to take a brief break. Um, I'll have to bridge of retired to the jury room, and we'll get you out just as soon as possible. All right. You haven't seen it, right? No, nope. no. Okay, well then take a look at it. Can't make objections without knowing what you're looking at. As soon as you've seen it, we'll bring it back in and take objections. Um, John, so you can sit down for a few minutes if you'd like. We'll take a 10 minute break. Okay. Or however long it takes to listen through. How long is it's it? Not okay. But 10 minutes would be good.
defense had offered defense four, tendered to the state for inspection. State any objections? No, Your Honor. No objections. All right. Hearing no objections, defense four is admitted and you may publish. And for the record, uh, defense exhibit number four has two video clips. Permission to publish, Your Honor? Okay. And no objections to either video clip included in defense four? No objections. All right. Very good. You may proceed. Okay, Charlie, so you go ahead, you can come toward me, just so for the jury to be able to see. Okay, so at time set 14, in regards to the fight, who's wearing the white t-shirt, who's wearing the blue t-shirt? Um, the black's wearing the blue one. Hold on, honey, you got to talk real loud. Is it James is wearing the blue one, <coughs> and Tim's wearing the white one? Okay, and what is Tim's demeanor on this still shot? He's shooting his head. I'm sorry, I need for you to speak up a little bit. He's shooting his head. I'm gonna do this, Charlie. I'm gonna position your body and move around so you can speak openly, okay? Okay. Hold on just a second. The jury didn't hear your, why don't you start over with who's who? Zacchaeus is in the blue, Tim is in the white. Thank you, ma'am. And what is Tim's demeanor like in this still shot? He's protecting his head. What is he protecting his head with? His hands. What is Zacchaeus doing in this video? Punching him in the head. Okay. Presenting what the fuck? This video at we got nine seconds left here. Who? I know you're young, but what was just said on the video? You a hoe on blood? Okay. Who is the girl yelling in the backdrop? Uh, me and Dequila. You gotta speak up. Me and Dequila. Okay. And who was yelling in the video? Miss Altman. to publish the second video. Ms. Herrera grabbed Zach off of Tim, and then Mr. Boyd grabbed um, Tim, and then they just went to the like he like got him up off the floor, and then I don't know what happened after that. I walked back. Okay, you may take a witness stand.
Charlotte, on the clip, there's someone yelling, I'm done. Do you recall who that is? Miss Alvin. And after, during this moment, would you, would you characterize this fight as being intense? Yes, ma'am. Would you characterize it as being violent? Yes, ma'am. Uh, were were y'all concerned when y'all watching this video? Yes, ma'am. After the gunshots go off, where exactly do you run in the school? I ran straight down that hallway. It's like a hallway that has lockers and a water fountains, and I ran down that hallway, and then I made a left. When were you? Uh, when you ran down this hallway, did the trophy case break? Yes, ma'am. How did that make you feel? Mm, I was I was a little bit scared because I knew that the bullet was kind of close. And even though you felt that way, do you think that Tim intended to shoot you? No, uh, objection, Your Honor. That's inappropriate opinion evidence. Speculation. Same. When were you able to call your mother? I called her while I was turning that hallway. And how long did it take you to actually leave school that day? Um, maybe about an hour. <laughs> Defense will pass the witness. Or cross examination. Thank you, Honor. Charlie, um, how old were you on October the 6th of 2021? Um, I think I was 16. Where was your regular class that morning? Who's teacher? I mean, what classroom? Coach Boy. Okay. So you were not supposed to be in Altman's classroom? No. What were you doing in the hallway? I was late to class. I was going to Mr. Boyd's class. Okay. So, um, you stopped and popped the back and, and took your phone out, right? Oh, I had already had my phone. Because okay. I didn't have a backpack. You just had your phone in your hand? Yeah, because I was already on my phone. Okay. And when he went into the classroom, the door was supposed to shut behind him, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Uh, but it didn't shut. No, ma'am. You, did you catch it before it shut? And no. He, I, I, I don't kind of, Hold on, let's not talk over each other. I, I know it's okay. tempting. Let her ask her entire question. Make sure it's simple. Go ahead. What happened with the door? It was like, it was closing, but Miss Allman had like, she had held it a little, and then that's when I like went in and like pulled it open. Okay. And the reason that you did that is because you wanted to videotape. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. And so when the fight starts, um, are you standing in the doorway the entire time? Yes, ma'am. You never actually went into the classroom? No, ma'am. All right. And is Miss Altman trying to get you and other students to get away from that doorway? She wasn't really saying for us to get away from the door. She was more so calling help for other teachers. Are you one of the ones that was standing in the doorway that she was telling to move away from that doorway? Mm, I don't know. You don't know? I, she wasn't really yelling, like she wasn't really talking to me or yelling at me. Okay. Like, and you mentioned for the defense attorney that you were concerned, that you became concerned? Yes, ma'am. Were you the student that when Coach Boyd came around to the classroom, um, and then uh, Coach Walker, were you the one that was standing in the doorway laughing? No. Were some people laughing? Yes. Okay. Who's the person that says, what the fuck? Me. Who's the person that says, damn? Me. Okay. But you're not laughing? No, ma'am. All right. So when you hear the gunshots, you see that it's Tim that has a gun, right? Yes, ma'am. So you saw that part. I didn't see him like with the gun, but I seen him fight. Like I seen the shot fire off. Okay, so you saw you saw when Zach got hit the first time. 
No. I just just seen the gun. Like I just seen the gunshot. Like, I just seen the gun. Like the fire from the gun. Okay. And you saw that Kim had it, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So you start running straight down that hallway towards the glass case, mm -hmm. right? Yes, ma'am. And you felt what go by you? A bully. And you said that you're just a little bit scared? Yeah, I just was like, cause I didn't, I knew in my heart that he wasn't coming for me. Okay. But if that bullet had hit you, you'd still be dead, wouldn't you? Maybe. I don't know. Right? I don't know. How about those other girls that were closer to the glass case that were Objection. ahead of you? Objection to speculation. If you're asking the same question as to those other girls, then I'll sustain the objection. I'll rephrase. Okay. Were there other students in that hallway that were a little bit ahead of you, also yes. running? Yes. Okay. Whenever you're down that hallway, do you see the glass case break? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Where was that when you when you see um, him firing that weapon? He was running. He's running? He's trying to get out of that classroom like the other students? Yes, ma'am. And you've already identified on that video that Coach Herrera and Coach Boyd came in and one of them had Timothy and one had Zach. Yes, ma'am. Right. And the reason that you know that is the reason, or is it true that the reason that you know they separated them is that's how you had a clear view of Tim getting that gun? Yes, ma'am. Did you ever turn around and look back down that hallway at what was happening? No, ma'am. Why not? I was just trying to get away. Because you were a lot scared, don't you think? Objection and speculation. I'm asking her if she was her emotional state. You, you asked if she was trying to get away? I was asking her if she's scared. Oh, that's over. Mm -hmm. A little bit. A little bit scared? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. And you didn't come back to, to finish videoing, right? No. All right. Where did you go? To the police office. To the police office? Is that downstairs? Yes, ma'am. In that video, what are you wearing in that video? I have on a white shirt. It has, I think, green lettering on it. And I have black um, biker shorts and some white bands. Okay. Pass the witness. Oh. Redirect. Charlie, on the video, we hear you saying audibly, what the fuck and damn. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Why are you saying that? Because he was getting thrown around. Like, it was just, it was too intense. Is that the reason for why you stopped filming the fight? Yes, ma'am. And is that why you just left and ran down the hallway? Yes, ma'am. No further questions? All right. Anything further uh, cross? Just briefly. Okay. I thought you just testified that the reason you started running was because Tim had a gun. It was more like, it was both. Like, after he got his head stomped on, that's when I was already about to walk away. But then I had looked more, and then that's when I seen him get the gun. Because when that fight's going on, you're not stopping to video. You're keeping video. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, ma'am. It's only when the gun comes out that you said you heard Judge uh, Coach Boyd say, gun, and you start running. Is that right? Objection to compound question and ask and answer. <clears throat> you can answer. It was more so of like, me just trying to get away. Okay. I didn't, he yelled gun after 
he had already been stumped on. And after he got stumped on, that's when I was about to walk away. Okay. All right. I don't have anything further. Right. Any further redirect? Nothing further from the defense. Okay. Ms. Witten, be excused. Yes, yes Judge. All right. Maybe <coughs> excuse. Uh, All right, so it, it's come to the, the court's attention that there may be a witness that you're trying to get available. And there's one thing for the court to consider um, to give y'all time to get your witness here or find another method by which to present them. But if you've got other witnesses in this trial, your decision to call them is now. Do y'all have any other witnesses?
I'm assuming you're requesting self-defense. I'm assuming we still want the right to charge. Uh, no, I just need to, we're going to do the charge conference at some point, but I just need to know what we're doing. Right now. Yes, ma'am. Okay, you are correct. That's what we would be requesting. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else before we adjourn for the day? I presume you're putting transferred intent in there. I don't know what our... Yeah, why don't you also send proposed... I've got a couple of different ways we can do transferred intent. If you've got a way that you are going to be requesting it, please um, send it. Include both parties. Can do. Okay. And we will be objecting to self-defense. I understand. And I'll be taking a look at that as well. I'm not making that any kind of ruling with regards to that right now. All right. But anything else today? All right. Can you give me an update by, by when? Why? I would I mean, I've uh, sent her an email, okay. so she's right. been pretty communicative. Good. All right. Well, then hopefully y'all can give me some kind of answer before five. If not, somebody's got my cell phone, but I just need to know what I'm doing before I get here tomorrow, okay? All right. Judge, do you want us to remain available today to, uh, to work on the charge? I should have it ready for tomorrow. Yeah, if you go ahead and send me instructions and argument on the charge will be tomorrow. Well, let's, let's start. You want to talk to you?